Today is Tuesday, November 20th, uh, 2018. Happy Thanksgiving. Um, before we get into the invocation, I would like to make sure that uh, we do remember um, that Council Member uh, Brenda Haywood's uh, mother passed away since the last meeting, and certainly our prayers and thoughts go with uh, her and her family. So will all members of the Council as well as the public please rise for the invocation, remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, the invocation this evening will be offered by Bishop J. Mark Spaulding uh, of the uh, Catholic Diocese of Nashville. He is a guest of Council Member Kathleen Murphy. Let us bow our heads. And in this week in which we remember how truly blessed we are, let us call to mind and heart our families. friends, the communities we serve, this great city of Nashville, this wonderful state of Tennessee. Good and loving God, send forth your spirit upon this council. Be with them in all their deliberations. Send forth the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of right judgment and courage. May they know of the wonder of your presence in their life and bless the people they serve always. And we ask this prayer in your holy name, Lord and God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance. You may be seated. Uh, without objection, we will suspend the calling the roll and ask the clerk to record the names of those members present. Throughout the meeting, is there a motion for adoption of the minutes? There is a, a motion properly seconded for the adoption of the minutes from November 6, 2018. Uh, without objection, uh, the minutes of the meeting will stand approved as written. Uh, Madam Clerk, are there any messages from the mayor? No, Mr. Vice Mayor, there are no messages from the mayor. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. So we have uh, two presentations tonight. Uh, we're going to start uh, with uh, Council Member Murphy, Mendez, uh, Syracuse, and others. Um, so uh, if you will proceed to the back, and I will recognize uh, Council Member Murphy. Thank you. Tonight we are honoring the 12th Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Nashville, Most Reverend J. Mark Spaulding, as well as welcoming him to Nashville. One year ago tomorrow, Pope Francis announced that then Reverend Spaulding would be installed as our 12th Bishop. Bishop Spaulding was ordained about nine and I'm sorry, ordained here as our bishop about nine and a half months ago and has hit the ground running ever since. This weekend I did a little bit more reading about his background. The first thing I came across about him was that he can, quote, preach an engaging homily and still say the, pr the mass in under an hour without cheapening the experience. <laughs> Hopefully our council meetings can, can take a note from that. In seriousness, and more importantly, he is often referred to as a servant leader and a people's pastor. Known for being authoritarian, but warm, kind, and approachable, he is said to have an enthusiasm for being with the people and preaching the joy of the gospel. The Diocese of Nashville has had three bishops in my lifetime, two of which I have served with as an altar girl at two of our historic churches here in Nashville. I think that I have now aged out of the altar server program, so it is fitting and proper that we honor him tonight in our historic courthouse. I look forward to working with the bishop um, to confront some of the social challenges facing Nashville. I believe that not just our Catholic diocese, but all of Nashville is blessed to have him and will benefit from his leadership and being a part of our community. So councilmen, if y'all would join me to read our resolution. Thank you, Vice Mayor, members of council. 
it's an honor here to read a resolution recognizing and welcoming the most Reverend J. Mark Spaulding as the 12th Bishop of the Diocese of Nashville. Whereas on November 21st, 2017, Pope Francis announced that Reverend J. Mark Spaulding would be installed as the 12th Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Nashville following the untimely death of the most Reverend David R. Choby on June 3rd, 2017. And whereas Reverend J. Mark Spaulding was ordained as bishop and installed as the head of the diocese, Nashville Diocese on Friday, February 2nd, 2018 at Sagrado Corazon in the Catholic Pastoral Center in Nashville, Tennessee. And whereas the very Reverend J. Mark Spaulding, a native of Fredericktown, Kentucky, had previously served as pastor of Holy Trinity Parish and Holy Name Parish and as the Vicar General in the Archdiocese of Louisville, and whereas, following his ordination into the priesthood on August 3rd, 1991, Bishop Spaulding served in multiple positions throughout Kentucky, including associate pastor at St. Joseph and chaplain at Bethlehem High School in Bardstown, Kentucky, associate pastor at St. Augustine in Lebanon, Kentucky, associate pastor at St. Margaret Mary in Louisville, Kentucky, and pastor of Immaculate Conception in LaGrange, Kentucky. He also served as a judge, judicial vicar, and director of the Tribunal of the Archdiocese in Kentucky. And Whereas prior to entering the priesthood, Bishop Spaulding attended Bethlehem High School in Bardstown, Kentucky, and St. Minard Seminary in Minard, Indiana, he received a Master's of Religious Studies and licensed in Canon Law at American University in Louisville, Belgium. And whereas Bishop Spaulding will now serve as the head of the Diocese of Nashville, which includes approximately 76,000 registered Catholics in 53 parishes covering 38 counties in Middle Tennessee, as well as three missions. And whereas it is fitting and proper that the Metropolitan Council recognize and honor the ordination and installation of the Most Reverend J. Mark Spaulding as the Bishop of the Diocese of Nashville and to welcome him to his new home in Nashville. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County that the Metropolitan County Council hereby goes on record as recognizing and honoring the ordination and installation of the Most Reverend J. Mark Spaulding as the Bishop of the Diocese of Nashville and further welcoming, welcoming him to Nashville and Davidson County that the Metropolitan Council Office is directed to prepare a copy of this resolution to Bishop Spaulding, and that this resolution shall take effect from and after its adoption, the welfare of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County requiring it. And with that, welcome, Bishop. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, please know that you all have a vocation. We in the church, the Roman Catholic Church, teach that the political life is a worthy calling given by God for you to help us create the best place on earth. In Nashville, and my experience of it has been you've done a good job. The people here are worthy, noble, honorable people, and you have a good people to serve, and you are good people as well. Thank you for saying yes to service to our people. You build up the common good, recognizing everybody, as we teach, created in the likeness and image of God, and that's wonderful to behold. And so hear this from me, from our whole community of Roman Catholics in this middle part of Tennessee, Thank you. We are grateful for what you do. May we continue to help you in your service, and may our service be one in which we work together. As we teach in our church, we're always working to build what Jesus wanted for us. He wanted people to see each other in a wonderful, beautiful, magnificent way. And opening our eyes to the other, especially the poor and the less fortunate, those who look different than us and may even speak different than us, that we see them as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we walk this journey together. And so, once again, may God be with you, God bless you, and know you've got this bishop praying for you. God bless you all. Thank you all.
Thank you, Bishop. You may want to stay because we're getting ready to uh, honor the predators, oh, yeah. and uh, we <laughs> might uh, we might want some help there. Uh, Council Member uh, Weiner Freeman, I think you've got the next presentation. Council Member Freeman, you're recognized. All right, yes, sir. All right, uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, we have a resolution recognizing Nashville Predators General Manager, Mr. David Poyle, upon becoming the winningest general manager in Nashville Hockey League history. Whereas Mr. David Poyle became the Nashville Predators franchise first general manager in 1997 and has been responsible for all facets of the organization's hockey operations ever since, from coaching and training staff to minor league operations, to drafting and developing players, to assembling the team that fans follow on the ice every season. And whereas the on-ice success of the Nashville Predators have been repeatedly accredited to Mr. Poyle, who has assembled and led a team of managers, coaches, scouts, administrators who continually identify, draft, develop, motivate an exceptional group of players and Whereas under Mr. Poyle's direction, the Predators have advanced to the Stanley Cup Finals and repeatedly qualified for the Stanley Cup playoffs in previous seasons. Whereas on March 1st, 2018, Mr. Poyle continued this unprecedented level of success and made National Hockey League history by becoming the winningest general manager in the NHL with his 1,320th victory, and whereas previously Mr. Poyle had become the first general manager in NHL history to guide two separate teams to at least 500 wins, as he also posted 594 wins with the Washington Capitals from 1982 to 97, and he is also the only general manager in NHL history to record at least 1,000 games with two different teams. And whereas it is fitting and proper for the Metro Council to recognize the outstanding success of General Manager David Poyle upon becoming the winningest general manager in NHL history and to wish him continued success. So now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of Metro Government of Nashville and Davidson County that the Metro Council goes hereby on record as recognizing Nashville Predators General Manager David Poyle upon becoming the winningest general manager in National Hockey League history. Thank you. Uh, 20 years ago, my family and I moved to, uh, to Nashville and uh, didn't know what we were getting, getting into, but I must tell you, it's, uh, I must be a lucky guy because it's been 20 great years. It's great to call Nashville home. I am so proud of, uh, of our franchise and hope uh, all of you are too in terms of what uh, we've hopefully committed to uh, Nashville, uh, not only on the ice, but probably equally, if not as important, off the ice. I'm very proud of uh, all of our players and all of our organization and what they do in the, in the community. Uh, I didn't know what it meant to be a volunteer, a Tennessee volunteer when I got here, but I, I got it now and I think all of our organizations got that. We got a great thing going here in uh, Nashville with Bridgestone Arena and our team being one of the best teams in the league right now. I think it's a, a fun night, whether you're a little bit of a fan or a great fan or not. And uh, it just feels like it's, we're at the right place at the right time and Nashville is the it city and we're really looking forward to trying to make the Predators the it franchise here. So uh, let's, uh, Bishop, appreciate it. A little prayer. We came so close to winning that Stanley Cup. So whatever you, whatever you can do, it's, we're almost there. So yeah, well, welcome to Nashville. You're going to love it. So thank you, everybody. This is a really, really nice honor. I really appreciate that. Um, the only number I really care about is winning 16 games in the playoffs, which is four, four rounds where you got to win four games, four times four is 16. We got 14 once. We need to get two more. Hopefully this will be the year. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Poyle. Um, Mr. Poyle, if you and the bishop would like to meet outside, that would be, um, we would accommodate. So on your agenda, 
there is a report from uh, committees uh, on matters other than legislation. I believe we have um, one report tonight. These are on the special committees. Um, I'm going to go to Council Member Roten for a report on the uh, from the special budget committee. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, I have been uh, talking with my committee members, uh, Council Member Erica Gilmore and Council Member Russ Pulley. Uh, we were uh, going to give a report on the budget and where we are financially as a city tonight. Uh, after talking with the financial department and the uh, administration, we felt it was better to wait two meetings uh, so that we get the end of quarter report so that we would have detailed numbers for the council and for the folks viewing at home so they would know exactly where we are. So we're going to defer this report for two meetings. We can get the quarterly report and we'll have exact numbers for the council and everyone watching at home. Thank you. All right. Thank you, council member. Any other um, reports? All right, seeing none, we will move on uh, to elections and confirmations. I'm going to go to uh, Council Member Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have for the Board of Appeals, I'd like to move the appointment of Mr. J. Ross Pepper for the term expiring February 26, 2019, and he was approved 4 to 0. And for the Airport Authority, the appointment of Mr. Jimmy Granberry for the term expiring April the 5th, 2021, was approved 4 to 0. All right. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, there's been a motion made to approve the confirmation of Mr. Ross Pepper for the Board of Zoning Appeals and Mr. Jimmy Granberry for the Airport Authority. I've got a proper second. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes. Uh, so um, if you will please stand when I call your name. Uh, Mr. Ross Pepper, uh, new member of the Board of Zoning Appeals. And uh, Mr. Jimmy Granberry, uh, new member of the uh, Metro Nashville Airport Authority. So on behalf of the entire Metro Council, we thank you for your willingness to serve and to volunteer your time and expertise. Thank you very much. All right, so um, several items before we move into uh, resolutions. Um, at the last meeting, um, I read a statement of civility into the record. Um, I plan to read parts of that statement at our meetings as a reminder of what we can do and should do as a body. Uh, so this is part of the statement that I read at the last meeting. We as a community and as individuals must pledge to uphold the basic norms of civil discussion and debate at our public events. We do this not to stifle free expression of views, but rather to protect it. As a community, we must commit ourselves and ask others to open their hearts and minds to healthy, respectful dialogue based on our love for our neighbors and our people. Thank you. Uh, tonight, I'm also announcing uh, the five members of the Blue Ribbon Commission that pursuant to Ordinance BL 2018-1314, uh, the vice mayor is allowed to select. Uh, the vice mayor pursuant to that ordinance is allowed to serve as one of the five members. Um, and uh, I think I can choose uh, every so often a designee, uh, but I will start and then um, I will designate if, uh, if necessary. Uh, the following other individuals will also serve on the Blue Ribbon Commission. Uh, Council Member John Cooper, uh, Council Member uh, Taneka Vircher pursuant to her role as budget chair. Uh, Ms. Tracy Kane and Mr. Patrick Green. Those will be the five members that will be uh, selected from the Vice Mayor to serve on the Blue Ribbon Commission. Um, now, one of the questions that came up, and I'll, um, I'll ask Mr. Jamison for a comment. I do not believe that anywhere in the ordinance is anything that says who can actually call the Blue Ribbon Commission together. That is correct. All right. So. Um, 
Uh, I'm just going to take that authority and I am going to designate Council Member Cooper to uh, be the individual that calls the Blue Ribbon Commission uh, to order. All right, Council Member Cooper, if you don't mind doing that, that would be great. All right, um, so uh, one last item before we get on to resolutions. Um, what we are going to do is, um, actually, uh, before we get to resolutions, we'll have the public comment period. But one last item before we um, to get to that is um, we are now going to announce the process and procedure for nominations for the board positions for the Community Oversight Board. And you should have on your desk a, um, a copy of a, um, a letter to members of the council, uh, to the mayor, to members of the public uh, that's dated today that is uh, in regards to notice of board vacancies regarding the Community Oversight Board. Because of the importance of this, uh, I'm going to read through the, uh, the notice and then I'm going to take questions from members of the council to make sure that we get this uh, uh, correct and to answer and address any questions that you may have. So on November the 6th, 2018, the registered voters of Nashville and Davidson County duly adopted amendment number one to the Metropolitan Charter, thereby establishing a community oversight board. It is now incumbent upon the Metropolitan Council to implement the board through the, the approval of individual board members. Per the terms of the Charter Amendment, the board must be in operational by January 31st, 2019. I will repeat that it must be operational by January 31st, 2019. To facil facilitate the confirmation process, the following schedule will apply to all nominations. November 20th, 2018, that's today, uh, is the formal announcement of vacancies. So um, this memorandum shall constitute formal notice to all members of the Metropolitan Council, to Mayor David Briley, and to all members of the general public of 11 vacancies on the Community Oversight Board, which is uh, referred to as the COB, uh, the Community Oversight Board of the Metropolitan Government. These vacancies are the result of the establishment of a community oversight board adopted pursuant to charter amendment, um, it was number one, on November 6, 2018. Per the terms of the amendment, members of this board are to be approved by the Metropolitan Council. Initial appointees shall serve at least a one-year term and successive board members shall serve staggered three-year terms. The 11 board members on the community oversight board shall be composed as follows. Seven of the board members shall be persons who are nominated by community organizations or private petition signed by 50 Davidson County residents. At least four of those seven members must reside in economically distressed communities. Two of the members shall be persons nominated by council representatives and two of the members shall be persons nominated by the mayor. All members must be approved by majority vote of the council. Now, if you will go back um, to um, economically distressed communities, obviously there's an asterisk by it. If you look on the, the last page, the third page, the term economically distressed communities is not specifically defined within the amendment to the Metropolitan Charter. The Metropolitan Planning Department has provided potential definitions for economically distressed communities, as well as geographic maps depicting locations in Nashville and Davidson County which qualify under each potential definition. And then there's a link to the information that would be available, so you can go to the link. Now, I'm gonna stop there and see if there are any questions so far. Councilman Glover. Thank you, Vice Mayor. My, mine is just a real quick one. It doesn't necessarily have to do with the election of the, of the board, but uh, the formation of this will take place prior to um, this year's budget being completed and we entering another cycle. So if someone could uh, just at some point in the future tell us where that money's coming from. Uh, I'm not, not asking you to give it to us right now, but I think it might be important for us to kind of understand where the finances would be coming from. So I will, um, I will and thank you for your question, Council Member. So um, in the charter um, amendment that passed, $1.5 million is the number that's referenced to provide the funding for this board. Um, our job at this point is to get through this process first. Um, 
the discussions about where that money will come from will have to be part of the discussions that goes on with the mayor's office and the Department of Finance. Mr. Jameson, any other comments? Uh, other than that the board members are non-paid, so this will have no specific financial repercussion for board members. Okay, so the board members are not compensated, okay? <coughs> so, Council Member Gilmore? Yes, I, did, I just wanted to make sure that the, um, I guess anyone that was interested knew where the petition form is. If you could just clarify that and just kind of how that looks and, and what's on it. Do, do they just have to have, it says 50 county residents, but they don't have to be registered or anything. Just a little bit more clarity on that and where people can find it. Okay. Thank you, Council Member. So uh, we're going to get to that in just a second in terms of the first part of your question. The second part of your question is relevant and probably ought to be addressed at this point. Um, so um, the uh, petition uh, has to be signed by 50 Davidson County residents. It's not registered voters. So, uh, Mr. Jameson, if you want to go further and explain what that means. Uh, a resident is simply someone who has a permanent residential, residential address in Davidson County. Often you'll see references to registered voters on petitions like this, uh, but the charter language does not include that reference. So it's simply Davidson County residents, period. And they can be any age? Yes. Okay. They can be any age. Okay. Council Member Pardue. Well, my question was kind of along the line of hers. Uh, they can be teenagers or preschoolers or they don't have to have any kind of qualifications or anything? So again, I'll, I'll um, thank you, Council Member, for your question. I'll turn that back over to Mr. Jamison. We are pursuing uh, this based upon the language of the charter. We can't change the language that passed. So it's Davidson County residents, and based upon my understanding, you do not have to be a registered voter and there is no age requirement. That's Mr. Correct. Jameson? That is correct. I'm good with that if you are. Council Member Vercher. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, just, just for clarity and, and understanding process also, how will um, residency be verified? Um, so, um, Mr. Jameson? The, uh, Metro Clerk's Office, uh, just to put this in perspective of what they would often get for Board and Commission members that require uh, a registered voter, they would often turn that over to the Election Commission. In this case, uh, I think you'll see a little later in the memo, the Vice Mayor does reserve the right to alter dates depending upon the number of nominations that are received by petition. Again, there are four ways to have your nomination submitted. If we get a large number of petitions, each of which has 50 residences to determine that will take a long uh, period of time. The clerk's office has been in contemplation with the election commission, with the vice mayor, and with the committee meeting last week of how best to determine or confirm residency. What was suggested by the, the meeting last week was that uh, the uh, nominator, uh, uh, verify, I'm sorry, the nominee that is being nominated by the petition sign a verification that each of the 50 individuals is indeed a Davidson County resident. Uh, the Metro Clerk's Office has explored the option of additionally sampling, contacting a, a handful of the residents to verify that they are Davidson County residents, but I think the primary solution is to have the nominee sign a verification that the petition signatures are from Davidson County residents. Council member, any other questions? Okay. So I, I, I will say that um, all of your questions are um, very relevant. Um, and uh, before we leave that first section, uh, all members, uh, so um, before I go back, Council member Gilmore, another question? One last question. Sure. So are they able to, um, can they submit this directly online, or are they submitting it to print it off and then turn it in? I think okay. that would cut down on some confusion, too. The, the second part, this will be available so that you can print it off at home or, or wherever. Uh, we do request, and you'll see a little later in the instructions, that the physical form be turned in uh, in person or by U.S. mail um, so that there's some consistency with the forms that are received. Okay, and then just one, one other quick question. 
So it says that seven of the board members shall be persons who are nominated by community organizations and or private, but there's, there's not a, um, there's no, even though the, the seven can be a nominated, I guess the question is only four are actually, res four spots are actually reserved for economically distressed. Right. Seven. But anybody can really nominate at the end, even though it's saying seven can come from organizations. I guess it, that has no bearing on how many are reserved. Is that? So uh, I, I guess the other way to think about that is of the 11, two come from the mayor's office, two come from this body. So now you're down to seven. Those seven have to be either by community organizations or petition. And of those seven, four have to be from economically distressed communities. Okay. So um, before we get into the next section, um, the last part of the nomination process is all members must be approved by majority vote of the council. Uh, and again, I'll turn to Mr. Jamison, but um, that's not specifically defined in the charter amendment. So it's not majority vote meaning 21, it just says majority vote. So based upon that, it's, I think it's my understanding that it's gonna be a ma majority of those people who are voting on the nominations, it would not necessarily be 21, Mr. Jamison. Right, and in instances where it's not specifically stated as majority of those members of the council, uh, of those uh, to which the body is entitled, meaning 21 of 40, it would simply mean a majority of those present and voting. All right, so let's go on. Um, December the 18th, 2018, that is uh, in just, uh, just less than a month from now. This is the deadline for submission of nominee forms to the Metro Clerk. Council Member Gilmore, this is gonna get to some of the issues that you raised. All nominations must be filed on the nomination form available at the Metropolitan Clerk's Office and at this web link. And there's a link in the letter that we will be sending out. Obviously you have it, we'll be sending out to um, uh, the media and any other groups that's interested, we will send this information out. Alternative versions of this form, such as handwritten versions, should not be used. Again, the, the, the key is should not be used. We'd rather have everything on the proper forms. Um, but again, um, and Mr. Jamison will uh, get to this in just a few minutes, but um, we are, I think we already know that there may be some handwritten forms already out there that uh, have been circulated. Again, alternative versions of this form, such as handwritten versions, should not be used, the keyword being should. All completed nomination forms must be physically delivered in person or by U.S. mail so as to be received by and filed with the Metropolitan Clerk's Office by no later than 4.30 p.m. on December 18, 2018. Filed nomination forms must include A, the nominee's full legal name, mailing address, telephone number, and email address if available. Uh, B, if the nominee is submitted by a community organization, the name of such organization. C, if the, nominee, if the nominee is submitted by a Metro Council member, the name of the member, the name of the Metro Council member. D, if the nominee is submitted by a petition, the completed petition form must be filed together with the nomination form. So petition forms are gonna be available at the Metropolitan Clerk's Office and at the web link that is actually stated here. For filing purposes, the address for the Metropolitan Clerk's Office is obviously um, Suite 205 uh, in the historic Metro Courthouse, One Public Square, Suite 205. Nominations can be received by any and all staff members of the Metro Clerk's Office. Received nominations will be read into the record at the regular council meeting on December 18th, 2018. So um, questions from council members. Council Member Gilmore. For the nominations, is it the normal process when it comes from a council member, only one no nomination per council member? There's no limitation. So uh, council members can nominate, I think, any number of individuals. That's correct. correct. There's no limitation based upon the charter amendment that says you um, that you can not, that you don't have to stop at one. You can nominate as many individuals as you would like. Okay, and then if they're nominated by a council member, they don't need the petition to get the petition signed, right? Uh, council member, that is correct. Um, the one change in our typical process 
is in order to make sure that everything comes in at 4.30 p.m. on December the 18th, 2018, we have a council meeting that night. But in order to get your nomination in, if you're going to nominate someone, you need to get it in physically into the clerk's office by 4.30 p.m. on December the 18th. You can't wait until the meeting that night to nominate. That would be too late. Okay, it has okay. to be any time from now up until the 18th, right? Because it's opening now. It is opening now. This is the okay. formal announcement that this process is open. But again, all nominations uh, will need to be in by 4.30 p.m. on December the 18th. Okay, thank you. And I, I really like this. So is this sheet, will it be on the website with the hyperlinks in the same format so they could just click on these links Mr. for anyone's interested? Uh, that is correct, Council Lady. You will see on the Council webpage, I believe they're deploying it at midnight tonight after tonight's proceedings. Uh, there will also be a dedicated webpage that the Metro Clerk's Office has uh, put together, which is a typical webpage of board and commissions. Uh, there will also be released tomorrow morning a press release with this information. And last but not least, this will also be advertised in the ledger, I believe, in the Friday edition. Okay. I think this is good. I, this is really positive. Now, are we going to outside of the ledger, because the ledger is a very, very specific, will there be other newspapers? Are there opportunities? I know there's cost for that, but just in fairness to other groups that would be outside of the ledger, we have a lot of other constituencies that would be interested that may not read the ledger, but would read a lot of other type of newspapers. The, uh, the amount of money that we're uh, paying to the ledger is not uh, unappreciable. The amount of money charged by other uh, dailies in this town is uh, cost prohibitive for the council's budget. Um, if others wish to um, contribute, we welcome that. But we do help hope that the press release will be picked up by all uh, uh, major news circulations. OK. So, um, council member, I understand the issue because that was discussed, but we will make sure that um, all media gets access to this information. It's very important, based upon the meeting that we had the other day, to um, utilize all available groups, resources, whatever, to get the information out so everybody understands what this process is and everybody can get access to the, uh, the links and nominate who they would like to. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Hastings. Yes, Mr. Vice Mayor, thank you. I just wanted to ask uh, the question uh, about the guidelines of the community organizations, uh, because I know that um, there are community organizations that may fly up overnight or per se. Are there any guidelines that are set of what a community organization is? Uh, is there something that there's a a filing or a filing with the state of Tennessee, or do we have any of those guidelines that are set? Uh, because I, I really feel that uh, uh, a definition of a community organization will probably be, be better, you know, served by answering those questions. But uh, it, it's kind of hard for me to understand what this, this ordinance or this bill means about that. And how do we, how do they actually choose individuals to, to come and to serve on this board by just saying a community organization? Council Member, a very good question, and that's why I'm turning it over to Mr. Jamison. The um, charter language does not have a definition of community organization. I know that has led to a lot of discussion among council members. Uh, some jocular comments that if the Donaldson Bowling League decides to submit a nominee, uh, can we contend that that is not a community organization? Um, and we would not be able to under the language of the charter. But the final composition of this board boils down to 11 approvals by this body. And I anticipate that this body will pay close and careful attention to the nature of the community organizations that are sponsoring each nominee. Okay. Anything else, Council Member? Okay. Uh, Council Member Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the Metro Council member nominations, is it sufficient simply to have the name of the council member on the on the form, or does it need to be the signature of the council member? 
The, the form, there is a nomination form that you'll see linked as well. It does have the council member's signature simply so that the clerk can verify that it came from the council member. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you, council member. Uh, council member Bedney. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I, I was uh, listening to the question by council member Gilmore and the answer by uh, our lawyer, esteemed lawyer Jemison, regarding how we are going to advertise this. And I wanted to encourage you all to, being that we are trying to get a cross section of the community, to advertise in all media uh, and all uh, groups in Spanish, in uh, uh, Somali media, all kinds of media, to make sure that we really get uh, people on that committee that represent the cross section of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. So that was also discussed at the meeting. Um, I think we're going to need help from council members to get the word out. So one of the things that I would encourage you to do is to um, take the form and send it to any groups that you might think would be interested or as many groups as you can, neighborhood groups. I believe that we may need um, help from council members to um, maybe spread that to the media. And council member Bedney, I uh, understand the concern and we may need your help specifically. Um, to um, reach out to, um, um, uh, to media um, that um, in the Hispanic community and other places as well. I think the, um, the intent is to try to get this information out to any possible groups. And again, we may need members of the council to, um, to attend certain events, to uh, maybe be um, on uh, media outlets to make sure that this information is broadcast. Um, again, I, I think it's pretty clear that this is very, very important to many, many people in this community. And so we want to make sure that we get the word out so we get um, as many nominations as people want to submit, All right? Uh, Council Member Kendall. Yes, uh, Vice Mayor, this is a, maybe a process question, a logistical question. But when they submit the, uh, receive the questionnaire, I'm assuming the questionnaire is, is, will ask questions about the candidate. Is that, is that what that's for? Now, when that goes to the Rules and Confirmation Committee, does that committee narrow that, those uh, petitions down to four, or do all the petitions come before the council, the names of those who have supplied the petitions? Because, you know, we may have 25, 30 petitions, and do all of them come before us to vote? Uh, they narrow it down before they get to us. So um, that's also an excellent question. Um, the, um, the charter does not, uh, the charter has certain provisions, the charter amendment has certain provisions in it that disqualify certain people from being on this board. But those are the only disqualifications that are listed in the charter amendment. Everyone else that submits a nomination assuming that there's no um, prohibition against them serving on the board, uh, will be vetted through the Rules Committee, but um, unless there's something in there that disqualifies that individual, then they will come before this council for a vote. So you said, uh, how many nominations did you say? Well, let's, let's say on a petition you had 25 people okay. turn in petitions and all of them met the criteria. What information would the council have when it votes on them relative to that person's qualification. So um, we are still working on the question and we're gonna to get to that part in just a minute. Okay. But I will say that um, we could have, there is no limit on the number of applications that may come in. So 25 may be a small number, we could get 150 nominations. Right. Okay, and in just a minute we'll explain the process of how we plan to try to vote through that. So if there's a question about it, you can certainly ask at that point, but right. certainly understand your concerns. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, moving on, so uh, December the 19th, this sort of gets into what Council Member Kendall was talking about. December 19th, 2018, distribution of questionnaires to all nominees. Upon receipt of nominations, the Metropolitan Clerk's Office will thereafter distribute questionnaires to all nominees at the mailing address provided by no later than December 19th, 2018. That's why everything has to be, on, be in by December the 18th. Uh, questionnaires will also soon be made available at the web link that's listed in the information. So at this point, we uh, are still working on the questionnaire. There is a draft that we're working through. 
Obviously, the questionnaire is not ready to be released yet. We're still waiting for nominations to come in. But um, Council Member Kendall, I think I understand the concerns, um, and that is what should be on the questionnaire so people can actually understand who has applied for these uh, positions. Any other questions about the questionnaires at this point? I know those are still in draft form, so we'll have more information as we get them to you. Okay, Council Member Hastings. So, Mr. Vice Mayor, so you, you're saying that we are doing the questionnaires for the vetting of people coming to this board, correct? So, Council Member Hastings, um, so this is a vote by you as members of the Metro Council, or us as members of the Council, um, to serve on this board. So, it's a form that we will generate, and it's a questionnaire. So. Um, in terms of the Rules Committee, right now we have a questionnaire that we, sub that we send out to anyone who is nominated for a board or commission. Um, that, for that form has to be modified to some extent to comply with the requirements in that charter amendment. You can't put more in that, you can't start defining terms in that questionnaire that have not been allowed by the charter amendment, so you can't put additional restrictions in. But I think this goes to what maybe Council Member Kendall was talking about, and that is what's going to be on the form so people can actually read through so they can understand who is applying for these positions. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Vercher. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Just, just again, just one last question as it relates to the process, because this is uh, really serious for our city and for, you know, for our respective communities. Just want to make sure that um, we won't have an issue as it relates to petitions being submitted. We can make sure that the equipment is working properly, the date stamp, the time stamp, and so forth, and that the clerk um, has received guidance to accept um, any and all petitions as it relates to um, nominees being brought forward. So um, uh, obviously the clerk is here. Uh, all those um, discussions have been held internally within the office and with the clerk's office, and um, people understand the importance of uh, the information that's coming in, and I think at this point, um, all the offices are ready to proceed and make sure that everything is handled properly. <coughs> Mr. Jameson, Madam Clerk, any additional comments? Okay. Good? Okay. All right, um, so moving on, January 4th, 2019, uh, this is the deadline for return of completed questionnaires to the Metro Clerk's Office. Obviously, one of the things we were working through were the holidays. Um, so uh, the questionnaires go out. January 4, 2019 is the deadline. All nominees must file their completed questionnaires with the Metropolitan Clerk's Office by no later than January 4, 2019 at 4.30 p.m. For filing purposes, questionnaires may be submitted and filed via email to the metro.clerk at nashville.gov. Obviously, that's on the, the form that will be going out, or to the Metropolitan Clerk's Office at the address below, which uh, I had repeated before, which is Suite two, 205 in this building in the uh, historic Metropolitan Courthouse. Any nominee who fa fails to file a timely completed questionnaire shall be deemed to have withdrawn his or her name from nomination. So let me repeat that again. You've got to get it in on time. Any nominee who fails to timely submit that completed questionnaire shall be deemed to have withdrawn his or her name from nomination. Any questions about that? Okay, seeing none, uh, January 15, 2019, appearance before the Rules Confirmation Public Elections Committee. All nominees must appear before the Metropolitan Council's Rules Confirmation Public Elections Committee on Tuesday, January 15, 2019. This committee will convene in the Metropolitan Council Chambers, located on the second floor of the Metropolitan Historic Courthouse. The starting time and length of the meeting will be determined by the number of nominees. Any nominee who fails to appear as scheduled before this committee shall be deemed to have withdrawn his or her name from the nomination. Uh, depending upon the number of nominations received, this meeting may be rescheduled. In such case, further notice will be provided. Any questions about that? So again, what I will tell you is that, uh, and this goes back to Council Member Kendall's comment, if there are 25 nominations, maybe we can handle the rules, uh, handle that before the Rules Committee on January 15th. 
if there are 150 nominations, um, we may have to uh, schedule special dates for the Rules Committee. So uh, a lot of this will be determined by how many nominations we receive, okay? Uh, the last part of this is January 15, 2019. This is election and confirmation by the Metropolitan Council. Upon receipt of recommendations regarding each nominee from the Metro Council's Rules Confirmation Public Elections Committee, the full Metropolitan Council shall elect and confirm 11 board members by majority vote at the regular council meeting on January 15, 2018. Depending on the number of nominations received, it is possible that this election and confirmation process will be rescheduled. In such case, further notice will be provided. Obviously, it ends by, um, if there's any questions regarding the process for filing nominations, uh, the clerk's office is provided. All right, so um, let me get to the questions first, and then we'll go over kind of how this would work on election and confirmation. Council Member Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. My question is um, the nominees, and, and I know you had gone over this part, but like with uh, jury duty, they eliminate people who may have some direct uh, association uh, with the um, issue, and they are eliminated from being able to participate. Would that not be um, an issue when it comes to this oversight board? So, uh, Council Member, um, I'm going to turn to Mr. Jamison in just a moment. We are restricted in terms of this process by the language in that charter amendment. So, again, there are certain restrictions about people serving in that charter amendment, but we can't add anything else to it. We can only follow what's in the charter amendment, and those people would be excluded. All right, so, Mr. Jamison. That's absolutely correct. Uh, that does not preclude, however, the council members from exercising their discretion on whether or not uh, a, council, uh, a nominee has a conflict, has a bias, or for whatever reason should not serve based on their affiliation or proximity to a particular group or issue. You retain that discretion. Um, I would also, just with respect to the questionnaire, um, uh, alert the council that we are receiving significant contributions from other metro de planning departments, uh, for example, will help you with uh, uh, the, four council, the four nominees that you have to pick from economically distressed communities. That's not defined, but the planning commission will use, I think there are five uh, typically used federal statutes for purposes of defining an economically distressed community. The planning department will receive the questionnaire as well, the questionnaire will ask, do you contend that you are in an economically distressed community? If the answer is yes, the planning department will list each of those uh, nominees and categorize left to right by grid all of the federal statutes that that person's residence satisfies as being economically uh, distressed. So every effort is being made with respect to terms that are not defined to define them as best we can for the council's ultimate consideration on January 15th. Council member. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, council member Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Two questions. First of all, do you think it would be possible that the council members will have sort of a list of the criteria that are called out in the charter I mean, there, there's some language in there that says they need to have experience in, in civic um, issues and with, with some, then they'll have to be willing to go through the police academy and stuff like that. I mean, if we could have that in front of us as we're making that decision, that might be a handy thing. So the, uh, the questionnaires that you're accustomed to seeing for board and commission members, that was the starting point for the, the questionnaire that the vice mayor is, is reviewing now. That has been tweaked to specifically address the criteria that are set out in the charter language. Your familiarity, um, your residency, whether it be in an economically distressed community, each of the specific criteria set out in the charter language has been added to this. Um, at least one of the advocacy groups has submitted additional questionnaires and the vice mayor is contemplating the addition of those questions. But at a minimum, we anticipate within a single block the additional specific criteria questions that are unique to this position. So that information will be in the, in the questionnaire, so Correct. we'll be aware of it there. Thank you. And then you may be getting to this in a minute, but just logistically, how, how will this work if we have 25 names or 50 names that we're trying to whittle down to 11? Will we vote on each specific slot, or is that something you're going to get to in a minute? 
So um, we've got a few more people in the queue. I was I was holding that one until the okay. end, if that's okay. So um, because that will take a little while, little while to explain. Uh, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, probably my uh, question, or rather answer, will come from uh, the Vice Mayor. But uh, my question was specific to how we're going to elect uh, 11 member. But however, I think we will be electing uh, rather nine members because two will be uh, mayor's submission or rather recommendation. So we will be uh, confirming those two uh, coming from uh, the mayor. And then we will be electing two uh, from the council member appointee or recommendation, and then seven uh, from uh, the community. And seven or four, seven is, uh, have to be, come from economically uh, disparate area. So, uh, in, so electing seven, that would be my uh, uh, question. Uh, electing four of seven, are we doing like at large uh, style? Each uh, council member can elect four at one time, or do we have to elect one by one by one by one? That would be my question. All right, so um, Mr. Uh, Jameson is going to answer that in just a minute. Uh, Council Member Kendall. Okay, th this is dealing with, uh, I think, kind of a follow-up with uh, Ms. Council Lady Allen's uh, question. How will we know, I mean, what information will we have before us as council members that we can distinguish between the qualifications of the candidates, especially the ones with the petition, other than they meet the basic criteria. I mean, if we have 25 and all of them meet the basic criteria and go before the rules committee and all of them are submitted to us as being qualified candidates, what do we have in our hands to distinguish other than the name and the residence? So will, will we have the questionnaire answers? Or Yes, Council Member Kendall, we will make sure that everyone has, I guess, a notebook of all the, um, the uh, individuals who have, nom who have been nominated through any type of process. Um, I think we're going to have to divide it by, and Mr. Jamison's going to explain exactly how we're going to vote, but uh, divide it uh, for the first seven, you will have to, because um, we're going to have to vote on four that come from economically distressed communities. So we'll have to have that grouping. Then the grouping for everybody kind of at that point falls into the seven after we get through the first four. Then you're going to have to have the questionnaires from um, individuals who have been nominated by council members. And then you're going to have the petitions. Uh, we believe there would be two coming from the mayor's office. And to go back to Council Member Amina Johnson's question, we do have to elect even the ones from the mayor's office, just like we do in through, through confirmation. So we'll elect all 11, but the process of electing uh, the first nine um, is sort of interesting and will be more interesting based upon the number of individuals that are nominated. And with that, um, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Jamison, and I would encourage you all to pay careful attention. Uh, because again, it's going to depend on the number of nominations, but this is going to be, um, this is how we plan to proceed in terms of voting. Mr. Jamison. This is, this is optional for the council, but what this council has uh, applied previously is uh, so-called slate voting. Uh, this council took that up when many council members expressed the discomfort of when you have a, a border commission that required, say, three positions to be filled and four members, uh, four nominees were contending for it. When you took each seat individually, the fourth person who never got on board was overlooked three times. And it was discomforting and, and understandably for council members to see the, the lady or gentleman behind them get voted over and voted over and voted over. So uh, slate voting came up at the same time as instant runoff voting came up. And what council members have done uh, in the past is they don't cast one vote at a time. If there is uh, a slate of three uh, positions to fill, you cast three names at the same time. So obviously, if you get a large number of nominees, 100 plus, that can cut down exponentially the amount of time you spend on it and hopefully allow you to move through it more efficiently and economically and charitably to those who may not uh, be selected. In this case, we cannot do a slate of the 11 because there are subgroups. We have to make 
sure, for example, that four are from economically distressed communities. So this will be somewhat slightly squeamish if the council chooses to go this route, but what you would do is on the nominations questionnaires, the third question at this point after your residential address is, do you contend that you live in an economically distressed community? If your answer is yes, first you'll get a grid from the planning department telling you whether or not they satisfy various federal definitions of economically distressed. But regardless of whether they do or not, those nominees who contend they are in economically distressed communities will be set aside and you will vote for that and from that group for four candidates, casting four in your slate of votes um, until you have members that reach a majority of a uh, present, until you have four members that, that fill each seat as you've done in the past, if this council decides to proceed with that. Then the next largest subgroup would be the remaining three of the seven that have to come either from community organizations or petition. Then you'd have the council nominees, two, and then the mayoral nominees, two. Questions? Councilmember Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Just clarification, economic distressed areas, you're saying if they check that, that area to say that they're, they're there, let's say if somebody uh, just called out one that's not in economic distress area, bail me and they, they put on economic distress, that's not necessarily knocking them out. They could still be up under that loop. But did I hear you correctly by saying that doesn't take them out of the group to be able to be under the economic distress area that by them checking that? That is correct, because the charter wow. language that was adopted refers to uh, four members that must be from economically distressed communities. It does not define what that means. And if we attempt to assert our own definition, that is adding a term to the charter a language that was not necessarily approved by the public. So the best we can offer you is the planning department will present to you a grid of the roughly five bodies of law that define what, what an economically distressed community can be. You have definitions ranging from the free and reduced lunch program, uh, from housing and urban development programs. Every single statutory basis for defining it will be set in a grid. Then you'll have Mrs. Smith, the nominee. She contends that she lives in such a community. In this column, here's the HUD definition. Does she meet that? Does she meet the free and reduced lunch definition? And of the five definitions, maybe she meets one or three or five or none. I would contend that the nominee from Belmede will meet zero, and that'll be information you have before, we, before you when you cast your vote for that nominee. Okay, so again, that does not eliminate that Belmede person from being a part of the, that particular group. It does not, and again, this goes back to there were certain terms that were not defined in the charter language. Uh, one of, the, uh, of your colleagues has already proposed essentially a friendly charter amendment, and remember this body has one more bullet in its holster for amending the charter this term this August, and that charter amendment could offer friendly definitions for what exactly is a community organization, what exactly do you mean by economically distressed, what exactly did you mean by majority. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Mendez. Um, Mr. Jamison, just to clarify, I, I thought I heard you say that if you check the box for economically distressed, that you'd only be eligible for one of those four spots? No, we would take that group uh, and, and have the selection of the four that have to be from economically distressed. But if you don't make that vote, the usual slate rule is if you don't get selected that round, you're still eligible for the next round. So somebody who's checked the box of economically distressed, who does not get picked for one of those four, he still or she still meets the other criteria, so they're still available. Okay, thank you. That's what I was hoping the answer was going to be. Thanks. Sorry. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Kendall. Yeah, the rules of the confirmation committee, what, what will they be doing? I mean, it seems to me that those five criteria you're talking about that they could be weeded out if they didn't meet any of them in the rules and confirmation. Why would they need to come to the council as a whole? 
so I'll, I'll, take the, I'll take the first shot of the question. So um, again, the, the Rules Committee is going to be vetting through these applications, making sure that we haven't, that uh, there's nobody that falls into the exception categories that would then be knocked out of consideration. I think what Mr. Jameson, and again, I'll turn to him in just a minute, is that um, there is no definition in the charter amendment that defines what an economically distressed community is. The best we can do is get information from the planning uh, department that will have to be considered, but um, there's nothing that defines exactly what it is, so you're just doing the best you can on that definition. Mr. Jameson. No, that's correct. Um, just to think, however, for one example that would be uh, theoretically excluding a nominee, uh, as you know, under the charter language, you cannot be a member of law enforcement. Uh, right. And uh, even if, if you're retired, you cannot have been, could not have been so uh, for the previous five years. But let's say there's a nominee who is currently a member of law enforcement. That would, by m any construction of the charter language, exclude that nominee. There are, however, some terms that uh, I think you've heard us acknowledge a couple of times are undefined and we cannot and the rules committee could not exclude them but that you will have sufficient information I think in front of you to allow you to make that individual assessment and judgment as to whether or not does this person really meet what was intended by economically distressed or nominated by a community organization and it's a genuine community organization thank you thank you council member um, anyone else All right, so um, this information is on your desk. It will be going out in a press release form in the morning. Um, what I will say is um, obviously uh, this is a very important process we're going to go through over the next two months. Um, we're going to need uh, council members' help in m several different ways, including getting the word out uh, regarding the information contained in the memo that you have on your desk. Um, we're probably going to need help um, we may need help with different media outlets. Um, and so we'll need council members' help on that, making sure we get the correct information out. Um, and again, remember from a council member standpoint, uh, we nominate two from this body. So again, typically the process is we take nominations from the floor. That's not what's happening in this case. You'll need to get a nomination through, the, through a proper form into the clerk's office by 4.30 p.m. on December the 18th. Uh, Council Member Gilmore. I just wanted to uh, tell you, thank you, Vice Mayor. This took a little bit of a time, but I think it's very important because of the interest that was shown in vo voting on the amendment. And I think we are gonna have a large number of people. So I just wanted to say that I, I appreciate that a large number of people that offer themselves up to be on the board. And I think it will help us to better articulate the process and to point those people that are interested in the right direction. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, I will tell you if there are questions throughout this process, and there probably will be, if you will get in touch with Mr. Jamison, if there's questions about procedure, uh, the clerk's office is available as well. Uh, but I would um, define my questions from council members to one of these two places so we make sure that everybody's on the same page. This is very, very important, okay? Any other questions? All right, thank you for the time. Uh, we're now gonna proceed to our public comment period. Uh, I believe we have two individuals who have registered in advance to speak to the council about matters to, uh, related to Nashville and Davidson County. Each individual will be given two minutes in which to address the council. Uh, the first individual up is Mr. Leonardo McLemore. He's from Mr. Uh, Kendall's district. Uh, he's from uh, 724 26th Avenue North. Good morning. As he said, I'm Leonardo D. McLemore, better known as LD. Uh, District 21, Ed Kendall, 724. This is a discussion of Cumberland. This is a brand this concept of supervision that I'm speaking about. The key word in this concept file that most of you have is humanism. There was a concept of supervision copyrighted in 77, 78. I was born in 78. This is a how you say a way of looking at things imaging in the exact same form that he was speaking of before. I have nine kids. 
and we're in a community that is in desperate need of support and their age does not matter. Uh, but that is not here nor there. What we're talking about is the worldwide web and the worldwide acknowledgement of sports and how it can happen and transpire in the image of its own self, its brand. Its brand leading to plenty of lives and plenty of stakeholders having all interest in lives and humanism. So as we sit here and we discuss anything behind or for, we talk about humanism as the only example to lead with. I'm a leader in my community. It is a stroud. You can come to 37208, see Pearl Cone. You can see the nine churches that have been surrounding me since I was born here in Meharry General Hospital in 1978 as I witnessed a man of distinction in the corner, Mr. DeCosta Hastings. MOD, we was bred to do things in a humanitarian manner. And I've been doing that for five years with this company and brand, and I'm knocking at the door of Adam Seals Commission with the answer, the question, being Nashville. Um, the bargain is not here. Uh, I don't have the money. I'm in that neighborhood. I do for those children. They love me. They call me Coach LD, Coach Leo. I hit a corner. There's a Pearl Cone High School Firebird. Knowing me less time than they've known anybody else, we don't discuss what they do because their age doesn't matter. But I have nine kids. So, Mr. McLemore, those two minutes go pretty quick. Yeah. All right. I got to go, though. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, uh, second person is uh, Ms. Odessa Kelly. Uh, Ms. Kelly's from uh, Council Member Anthony Davis's district, uh, 1127 Cahill Avenue. Ms. Kelly. Good evening, Council. Uh, good evening, members of the public. Odessa Kelly uh, from East Nashville. Uh, here to speak about Amazon. I think last week we all found out about Amazon at the same time, and I think we all got the same information about Amazon, uh, which is very vague. Uh, that's disturbing to me. I don't know whether to be happy about Amazon coming or not, just because there hasn't been enough transparency and the information is not there yet. Uh, with that said, hopefully all of you got this. It's just a little mini packet uh, that us econ nerds put together. <laughs> uh, as you know, this council passed the Do Better Bill on January 2nd. Congratulations to all of us for doing that. I think one thing all of us uh, have strived, you've been elected members and us, uh, the public, is that we need more transparency on what happens here in Nashville. Uh, this is that anything that has a, a cash grant or a pallet, which is payment in lieu of taxes, it is uh, subject to the Do Better Bill. And right now, Amazon will be the first thing that is subject to that. It is, goes through the Mayor's Office of Economic and Development. Uh, I don't see Matt Wilshire here, so maybe he's hard at work putting that package together for you guys. So, you know, just text him, call him, make sure you get that package. I'd love to see it as well. Um, one of the things that uh, I was thinking about is that we're giving away $15 million to Amazon. That is almost half the uh, budget deficit of last year. And as a Metro employee, uh, took her punch on the chin about uh, raises because I trust you guys. You said that it was not what was best and needed to keep the city afloat. One thing we can do is have more transparency about where every dollar and every facet of this deal is going for Amaz uh, to Amazon. Uh, some of the things that we need to know about is what is Amazon going to do for the working class here in Nashville? I think that's something that we are all stressed about, and it's okay to say we haven't figured out all the facets of it, but it needs to be a priority for you and for us. Um, I'm pretty sure that Amazon is not going to pay its custodians, its maintenance workers, and everyone else 150 k so I'd like to know what we're gonna, what's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. <laughs> all right, so... Uh... So uh, we are going to uh, now move on to resolutions on the consent agenda. Um, we finally made it to, go to the bottom of the first page. Um, so uh, the following items are on the consent agenda. I'm going to read the resolution numbers on the consent agenda and then see if anybody needs to um, bump any of the items. So uh, actually this one is pretty easy. We have a, uh, two pages of resolutions. There's only one to be bumped off the consent agenda and that is Resolution RS-2018-1486 by Council Members Vircher and Freeman. Are there any other items that need to come off the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, then I'm going to read through the captions. Uh, RS-2018-1485 uh, by Vircher and Freeman, Resolution Approving Amendment 1 to a grant from the State of Tennessee Department of Finance Administration to the Metropolitan Government of National and Davidson County acting by and through the Office of Family Safety 
for a Family Justice Center navigator position. Uh, resolution RS-2018-1487, Bertrand Freeman. Resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement bind between the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson, Davidson County, acting bind through the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department and Tennessee State University for extra duty police services. Resolution RS-2018-1488, Councilmember Vercher, resolution authorizing the Metropolitan Department of Law to compromise and settle the claims of Dan and Sandy Feltner against the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County in the amount of $175,000. Resolution RS-2018-1489 by Councilmember Vercher, resolution authorizing the Metropolitan Department of Law to compromise and settle the claims of Roger Gordon and Delia uh, McDonald. Cloud against the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County in the amount of $28,777.87. Uh, said amounts to be paid out of the self insured liability fund. RS 2018-1490 by Council Members Mina Johnson and O'Connell. Resolution to approve an intergovernmental uh, agreement between the State of Tennessee, Department of Transportation, and the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County for the acceptance of the Hillwood Boulevard Bridge Rehabilitation over CSX Railroad in Richland Creek. Resolution RS-2018-1491 by Council Members O'Connell and Bedney. Resolution authorizing 401 Union Hotel, LLC, to construct and install an aerial encroachment at 401 Union Street. Uh, resolution RS-2018-1492 by Virtue and Gilmore. Resolution approving a contract between the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, acting by and through the Metropolitan Board of Health and Monroe Harding, Inc. to hire one part-time administrative assistant for the Adverse Childhood Experiences Nashville Initiative. Resolution RS-2018-1493 by Councilmember Gilmore. Resolution approving an agreement to detail for the Public Health Associate Program between the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, acting by and through the Metropolitan Board of Health and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to provide an associate to assist public health agencies in developing, implementing, and evaluating public health programs. RS 2018-1494 by Councilmember Gilmore. Resolution approving a long-term food information sharing confidentiality agreement between the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County acting by and through the Metropolitan Board of Health and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to facilitate the exchange of non-public food, human and pet foods, and animal feed, and cosmetic regulatory public health and safety information. Resolution RS-2018-1495 by Councilmember Syracuse. Resolution recognizing Nashville's Parks and Recreation Department and employees for their statewide honors and recognition at the Tennessee Recreation and Parks Association 67th Annual Conference. And Resolution RS-2018-1496 by Councilmember Hurt. Resolution expressing the Metropolitan Council's condemnation of mass shootings, hate crimes, and violence motivated by hate in all of its forms. All right, I am going to go to um, committee reports, budget committee, Council Member Vercher. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, RS 2018 1485, budget and finance recommended approval, 1240 against. Um, RS 2018 1487. 1488, 1489, 1490, budget and finance recommended approval, 1440 against, and RS 2018, 1492, budget and finance recommended approval, 1440 against. All right, thank you. Council Member Gilmore, Health and Hospitals. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, resolutions 1492, uh, four were in favor, zero against, and it was recommended to the full body for approval. And resolution 1493, four were uh, in favor, zero against, zero not voting, and it was recommended to the full body for approval. And the final one was resolution 1494, four were in favor, zero against zero not voting and it was recommended to the full body for approval. Thank you, Vice Mayor. All right, thank you, Council Member. Council Member Bedney, uh, planning. Thank you, Vice Mayor. The planning committee uh, recommended approval of uh, BL 2018-1491 for uh, 940 against. Thank you. Right, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Freeman, public safety. Thank you, Vice Mayor. The public safety uh, looked at RS 2018-1485 and 1487 and voted to approve six in favor, none against. All right, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Public Works, Council Member O'Connell. 
Thank you, Mr. President. We had RS 2018-1490, uh, nine in favor, zero against. We had RS 2018-1491, uh, nine in favor, zero against. All right, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Lee, rules. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Resolution RS 2018-1495 uh, and resolution RS 2018-1496 were approved four to zero. And with that said, all um, committee, all committee reports are in. So I would like to ask to move the consent agenda. All right, so I have a motion to approve all resolutions on the consent agenda. It's been properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt. Okay, we are back on the one uh, resolution that's off consent. This is uh, resolution RS 2018-1486 by Council Member Vercher and Freeman. This is a resolution approving an agreement between the United States Department of Justice, Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, by and through the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department, governing the participation of DEA Nashville District Office Task Force participants in the United States Department of Justice Equitable Sharing Program. Uh, Council Member Vercher. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, budget and Finance recommended approval eight for two against, and I'll need a committee report. All right, Council Member Freeman, Public Safety. Public Safety looked at RS 2018 1486 and voted six in favor, zero against. Okay. Thank you, Council Member. All right, uh, Council Member Vercher. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And this was uh, heavily debated in Budget and Finance yesterday. Um, we received clarity uh, with the distinctions that as it relates to this program, the equitable sharing and civil uh, for fixture, uh, as it relates to how the process is done on the, the state level. With that, um, I move for approval. Okay, so I have a motion to approve. It's been properly seconded. Discussion, Council Member O'Connell. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we talked about this a little bit last year as well, and uh, there's some new information this year, so I just wanted to bring to members' attention a couple things. In 1984, Congress passed a Comprehensive Crime, Crime Control Act. Embedded within it was a mechanism related to civil asset forfeiture that allows seizure of assets, both money and things like cars and houses, before a conviction has been secured at trial, and for the proceeds of such seizures to be distributed to local authorities that partner with federal agencies in the investigation. Meanwhile, from 1980 to 1986, as we discovered earlier this year, if you were born in the 37208 zip code, a large portion of which I represent, you were more likely to wind up incarcerated than anyone anywhere in America during that time. Federal policy on law and order and specifically drug policy and the outcomes for the children of 37208 in the 1980s is no coincidence, and yet we persist with public policy from that era. It's time for us to rethink our approach to criminal justice. We can simultaneously drive down incarceration rates and crime rates. I want to be very clear, though, my objection to equitable sharing is my objection to the federal policy. I have no evidence of any impropriety in our local implementation. In fact, I want to give special appreciation to Captain Alexander for making sure I had the best information available about our local efforts, and I am reassured that there is no reason to suspect that Nashville is a jurisdiction that has abused its participation in the equitable sharing program. Further, uh, I think it's imperative that we continue to fight a dangerous and deadly opioid epidemic. But that fight should not be part of a failed war on drugs. It should be a narrowly targeted fight intended to help people break free of addiction and bring suppliers to justice. My objection to equitable sharing is not rare or only local. In 2016, a broad coalition including the NAACP, the ACLU, Americans for Tax Reform, the Institute for Justice, and others sent a letter to the Obama administration's Justice Department calling for abolition of equitable sharing policy. Since we had this conversation last year, last year here in Tennessee, the civil rights implications of Tennessee's civil asset forfeiture laws and practices report prepared by the Tennessee Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights noted that there is an unacceptable risk that civil asset forfeiture as practiced in Tennessee is disparately impacting poor and low-income individuals, immigrants, people of color, and those without the means or ability to engage an attorney or contest the taking of their property. This is Nashville's opportunity to voluntarily step away from a federal program that has been harming communities and is not, in my view, worth the $165,000 a year we get from it. We can fight the opioid epidemic on our terms without seeking proceeds from a program that is literally about taking people's stuff and getting paid for it before they've even been to trial. 
I will be a vocal supporter committed to fighting to ensure that our Metro Nashville Police Department has the approximately $165,000 we stand to lose from our participation in this federal program in our local budget process so that we can police on our own local terms. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Purdue. Yes, sir, as the councilman said, there's nothing illegal about this program. There's not even any illegal questions about this program. I, I don't understand why anybody would vote against us doing something that would help the police department. It's obvious that this down council is not going to do nothing to help them. They beg for equipment, and that's what this money is used for, to buy equipment and to pay for the officers that's actually out there doing the work. I, I just I don't understand why anybody in this country would want to do anything against law enforcement. Thank you for your right. time. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Sledge. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor, and I appreciate the comments of uh, my colleagues. I know that we had a good discussion yesterday as well. Um, I first wanted to thank Captain Alexander. Uh, he has been uh, incredibly uh, open and forthcoming with some information that he's been providing. The council member has been proactive about communication. Um, and as we talked to this afternoon, I told him, you know, that I'm seeing two public concerns when it comes to the constituents I'm hearing from and, quite frankly, from folks all over the county, that there's a public concern about the opioid crisis that we're facing, and then there's a public concern about how people are being treated. Um, specifically by the police department. I think we just spent about 40 minutes um, talking about how we're setting up a board to address some of that. Um, I, I have a real issue when we're going to be basically fighting over essentially $150,000 a year um, that comes from these funds that I think sh everyone on this floor should be clear this process is going to continue. The task force will continue to do its work. There will continue to be asset forfeiture and seizure. Uh, the question is whether we're going to participate in being a claimant um, as a city to potentially get essentially 10 percent, up to 20 percent of the funds that may come from those assets. And as Captain Alexander stated to me and others over the last few weeks, these things are about a year and a half on average whether we're going to get any award at all. So the process is going to continue. The question is, are we going to be a claimant as a city? We are going to take a vote over essentially $150,000, $56,000 of which goes toward those opioid kits, which is incredibly essential. Those are also kits that can be funded through other means, like our 4% fund, which we've done. So when you take it down like that, now we're talking at less than $100,000. We're going to have a really big discussion over $100,000 and meanwhile, I would love for us to put our efforts toward pushing our state legislature to get us $1.4 billion when it comes to Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion that has been proven time and again serves opioid crisis and those who are affected by it more than anything else we can do here. Um, I know that we can't make any, I know that we can't make any headway on that, but we ought to be making our voices heard time and again about the fact that we're foregoing that as a state and meanwhile, having to debate time and again if we're going to get $150,000, um, of which really less than $100,000 is stuff that we can't easily, and I'll say easily, replace. I've committed to Captain Alexander that if we choose to not participate in the claimant portion of this and getting the funding from this, that I would work with whatever, whoever colleagues are, are willing to find the replacements for those funds, including funding those opioid kids immediately and acknowledging that with this rolling fund, you know, we, we have a little bit of a runway in order to make sure that we've got something figured out. I, I will close with this. Uh, the amount that we're talking about, once again, we sat here yesterday and many of us listened to the conversation from the policing project about the fact that we have, that our department has been making a bunch of stops that are disproportionately affecting African-American members of our community without impacting the crime rate, without impacting the crime rate. We sat here a few months ago and awarded $130,000 in a settlement that was a direct result of the practices that we sat here yesterday and acknowledged are not working. There are tons of different things that we can do as a body and as a city that will remedy the issues that we're facing 
we have the opportunity to say we're not going to participate in the funding of this. For that, I'm asking my colleagues to vote no on this. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Pridemore. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, you know, that, that, is a, that is a very valuable, very stunning uh, statement from my co colleague, and I appreciate his, uh, uh, his thoughts and his motivation behind it. But, uh, and also uh, other colleagues have mentioned here today. But you know, let, let's put this in perspective. For one thing, the, um, the police department has been involved in this uh, for over 20 years. And during that 20 year period, they, they, it's uh, served this city well. They have served uh, the employees of, uh, of the training for the uh, investigation of major drug transactions. Uh, preventing, uh, as Captain Alexander mentioned yesterday, um, talked about the the amount of uh, of drugs that was prevented from getting on the street last year, uh, which I think would have affected more than the population of this uh, of this city. But so, I, with my limited time, I just want to say, 20 years, and they've never had any issues with violating individuals' rights. They've never had any issues with the money going, being distributed in a way that's uh, that was shady. They've always been, um, uh, they have so many back backstops or so many checks to prevent the, the, mis the money from being misused. Also, this is, sometimes you get uh, different, uh, you get things confused. Again, this is not a state forfeiture. This is dealing with where major drug investigations have been, been involved with the state, with the federal government. They may initiate it somewhere else. We have one individual who's on the task force that because he's on that task force, he needs the training and the equipment and he get, needs the pay. And this is all part of that program. And another thing the what I'd like to mention is the, uh, I almost said the capital gains, it's gonna be tax time. Uh, but the, the funds or the property or the fruit of the crime, so to speak, they say they, uh, some may say, well, they, they, uh, they're taking their property. In my experience, their property is because of what they've been doing illegally. They're all gained illegally. And they have the opportunity during this process, they have the opportunity to prove and show that if they had their if, the, if their equipment, their um, property and, and money uh, was legally obtained, either through working uh, to a, a, a um, legitimate job or other means, then that money is not, see, it's given back to them. It's returned. It's only property and money that was gained in an illegal fashion, such as selling drugs, because they can't go to the bank and deposit. They have to do, th they have to buy property, they have to buy cars, they have to, they just have to hide cash because they cannot walk into a bank and deposit $50,000. So we just remember that. The property you say, some say maybe there's, we're illegally seizing, which we've never been, uh, 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 well, we may have been accused of, but, but never have we ever been uh, found uh, guilty of that in, in over 20 years. You can imagine all the, judicial processes that, that has been involved in, in, a, in, this, in uh, this occupation. But again, the money and the cash has been, uh, I mean, the money and the property has been gained in an illegal fashion and it's just going back to where it properly should be. And one other thing I would like to mention, they have been using their property and the cash as a bargaining tool to give them a life sentence. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Pulley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I won't belabor the points that have already been made. I thank all my colleagues for sharing their perspectives on this, and I'd like to share a little bit of mine. Uh, I just want to make a couple of points here. Number one, I think it's been made already that uh, uh, whatever we do with this resolution, it won't change any of the investigations or the forfeitures that are currently ongoing. Simply the equitable sharing uh, uh, portion of this, 
And uh, although it may seem like not a lot of money, but I don't want to minimize what $150,000 means to the police department uh, and how difficult it can be in this environment to get that kind of money. Councilman Glover found that out when he uh, uh, submitted a $360,000 resolution for the fire department. So that's not as easy, it's much easier said than done. Uh, also, uh, it's important to note that uh, the, uh, Captain Alexander informed us of the kind of cases that we're talking about here, and we're talking about significant bad actors, uh, significant drug cases, and uh, whether they're criminal for, and I've got, had some experience in this uh, uh, type of thing myself, working a number of uh, cases when I was in the FBI with the Metro Police Department where we had equitable sharing going on. And I think it's important to note, first of all, I'm a strong supporter of the asset forfeiture program because of what I've seen it do and what I've seen it accomplish. Uh, and some of the, the disenfranchised population that uh, my colleagues have spoken to are the ones who were really assisted by this asset forfeiture program in which I was involved because these are the ones who went to Metro Police Department in these organized crime cases as victims of these things please, saying, please can you help me? My mom or my father or my sister, they're just throwing away all our money to these uh, organized crime operations. And the, the way that we were able to significantly uh, uh, obstruct these uh, criminal enterprises is hitting them where it hurt, and that was in the pocketbook. We took the, uh, uh, the houses that they purchased with these ill-gotten gains, we took the cars that they purchased with these ill-gotten gains, and we took back the money that was stored in safe deposit boxes. But they're also, I'm, I think I need to point out, is their burden of proof with that. We had to prove where they got this, uh, where the, that the money was used or these vehicles or whatever were used in the conveyance of this operation. But uh, I can't uh, o overstate how important asset forfeiture was to breaking up these criminal enterprises. So, uh, you know, I'll close with, uh, you've, you've heard uh, some of my colleagues mention that the issues with the Tennessee forfeiture laws, and you've seen some of the emails that uh, relate to these Tennessee forfeiture laws, and that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about here today. We're talking about federal forfeiture laws, as, uh, which are uh, a part of a federal drug task force in which we've been involved for years. So uh, with that, I would just simply ask that we uh, continue down this path and support uh, this resolution. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Dow. Thank you. I don't want to repeat what's been said, but I think Councilman O'Connell said it best that uh, we need to handle federal issues at the federal level, not here locally. And so I encourage, <clears throat> excuse me, all of our council members to support this legislation. Um, one of the things that uh, I will bring up is that I have zero confidence in this council body to find $150,000. I mean, when you go back and look at budget time, we couldn't. Uh, find the money to address the budget issues that we had. So saying that we have $150,000 and I'll work with you and find it um, is a joke to me. Um, the other thing I will say is that when we know when we talk about finding any money, where we find money from, it comes from the most distressed and the most impoverished communities. It doesn't come from the wealthy communities in the city. So when we find the 150, it's coming out of a community that's already in need. And the last thing <clears throat> I will say excuse me, is that I really appreciate, um, you know, Councilman O'Connell uh, and uh, Councilman Sledge advocacy on criminal justice reform. I really like how you've championed um, the, the driving while black and the stopping and so forth and all of this, but we wouldn't have a lot of the criminal issues we have in the city or even crime problems and things that we have dealing with the police if we had more equity in this city. And we have an opportunity to really make a difference at budget time. In a few months from now, you can stand up and use the same fervor, the same advocacy to put money in these communities so that we won't have any issues. Uh, the issue is that we don't put money in and we don't invest in them. So standing up and advocating for reform and uh, taking away things from the police and making this an issue about um, you know, black, white, it's an issue about equity. It's an issue about how we in this city invest money in this city. And if we want to see some changes on the budget, just make a change right there. Stand up at budget time in a few months and put money in these schools, put money in these communities, give these kids a place to play, and you won't need the police there. It's that simple. But standing up and arguing about $150,000 and creating, um, this, we're gonna find 150, and I'm trying to prove a point on a federal program, to me, it's just, uh, you know, it's just not a legitimate argument. So I encourage all of us to support this, and at budget time, 
at budget time. In a few months, we will do our budget. Make a difference there. You all have an opportunity to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Glover. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'll make this very brief. I want to echo and I want to amplify a couple of things that a couple of retired officers have said. You know, when it comes to this arena, I try to always listen to what the experts are. And here are people uh, that in our own local that are retired. We have a federal retired. And they, they've given us their opinion that this is a good thing. Now, I will tell you, I don't deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. But what I do deal with is the same thing the rest of us do. I personally have tried to get funds, and I'm not giving up to get funds for our fire department and for our police department, because frankly, we've let them down tremendously over the last year. Don't think they're not paying attention and watching us. And the last thing we need to do is smack them around one more time by taking what I think is a mere pittance as far as the overall budget. If this works, and we've heard from what I consider to be the experts on the floor here, uh, if this works and it's important and it's important to our police officers, then it should be important to this body. So I will be supporting this. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Hager. As a practicing attorney, I'm probably the only one in here that's done confiscation hearings. And when you do confiscation hearings, whether they're state or federal, the burden of proof is just like anything else. It's on the state or the federal government to prove that the funds came from illegal sources. I've won some, I've lost some, and a lot of them get settled at that level. So I can tell you the only fault that I see in the system a lot of times is the fact if you do win a case, then it's the attorney fees that the person has to pay me to defend those. But if they want to go further, they can go through civil rights violation if their civil rights were violated in the stop and the seizure. But uh, in my opinion, the system, the way it is now, it works, and I'm going to support this because I have personal knowledge of how they work. And they're not, like people suggest they are, that they're out here just running, grabbing people's assets and their monies and things of that nature. I've been personally involved. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Swope. Call the question. Previous question's been called. Do I have a second? Okay, so we're voting on the previous question. All those in favor of voting on the previous question say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You adopt. We're on the bill. Um, because that I believe there's going to be some no votes on this, we're going to open up the machine. So we are voting on resolution RS 2018 1486. Uh, this is uh, again by Council Members Vercher and Freeman. Uh, resolution approving an agreement between the U.S. Department of Justice, Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Metropolitan Government. Um, so, um, Madam Clerk, open the machines. Clerks, everybody voted. Okay. Close the machines, take the vote. I'll let you repeat that again. Hold on. Nope. I've instant two abstentions. Okay, so the motion uh, passes. All right. So we are now on bills on first reading. Uh, if there is no objection, we'll consider all ordinances on first reading and one vote at this time. Is there a motion to approve uh, all items on first reading? Right. Got a motion properly seconded. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Um, motion passes. All right, so we're now on bills on second reading. All right. Uh, first bill up is BL 2018-1283 by Council Members Murphy, Henderson, and Mina Johnson. Uh, this is an ordinance amending Chapter 5.04 of the Metropolitan Code to restrict the use of proceeds from the sale of real property owned by the Metropolitan Government of Nashville. Council Member Murphy. Thank you. I'd like committee reports, please. All right. Uh, Council Member Vercher, Budget and Finance. 
Thank you, Vice Mayor. Budget and Finance recommended um, approval as amended, 14-4-0 um, uh, against. There were three amendments, amendments A, B, and C. All were approved, 14-4-0 against. Okay, Councilmember Murphy? I would like to move Amendment A. Okay, so uh, let's, get a, um, let's get a motion on the bill to get them all oh, in front I'm of us. Sorry. Motion to approve, properly seconded. Okay, so we're on amendment number A. Yes. All right, uh, so I've got a motion to approve amendment number A, properly seconded. Council Member Murphy. Thank you. Um, amendment A is basically what the administration and I worked out to clarify some pieces of this legislation. I'll go into more of an explanation of, the, um, of my legislation at the end of these amendments, but to get it on the floor and properly before us. Amendment A, what it does is it discusses um, back sale of tax properties, properties that didn't pay their taxes, being auctioned off, that type of thing. It takes it out of this bill. So to get it in its proper form, I'd like uh, approval of this amendment, please. Okay. Uh, you've heard the sponsor of the bill. Uh, this is on Amendment A. Any discussions on Amendment A? It's been properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Amendment A is adopted. Council Member Murphy. Thank you. I'd like to move Amendment B. This was also requested by the administration. It makes my legislation effective July 1st, 2019. With that, I move the amendment. Okay. So uh, uh, Amendment B, properly moved, properly seconded. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Amendment B passes. Council Member Murphy. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move the bill as amendment, amended with Amendment A and Amendment B after a brief explanation. Okay. Um, All right. Uh, Council Member Murphy has moved the bill as amended by A and B. It's been properly seconded. Council Member Murphy. Um, I will be giving y'all handouts um, over the next two weeks before we get to final reading. Um, I did not get time to pass them all out on your desk tonight. But basically, the, the handouts that I will be giving you goes into a little bit further detail about why it's important not to use reoccurring revenue um, for, for one-time expenditures. It's important to use non-reoccurring revenue to do savings such or pay off our debt services. Um, what I will get into is basically that all three credit rating agencies discuss in their methodology sections the link between matching reoccurring revenue to reoccurring expenses and attaining a structural balance. Um, there is a report, the truth in, in integrity in state budgeting. What is the reality? It's by the Volcker Alliance, a nonpartisan government research group created by the former Federal Reserve Board Chairman Paul Volcker. And it states a basic tenet of budgeting is that one time revenue should fund only one time expenditures and that re reoccurring revenues should cover obligations that come due every year. Um, while I'm going to give you all these documents and some, some of the budget recommendations from the National Advisory Council on State and Local Budgeting, uh, which is the Government Finance Officers Association that our own um, finance director is a, mem a member of, which I'm sure is, you're all thrilled and can't wait to get it, and I'm happy to, they're right here if you want them tonight. Um, at the end of the day, let's be real. If I sell my car tomorrow, can I drive my car to work? No, I can't. When assets are gone, they are gone. You cannot continue to spend if you do not continue to have um, those incomes. And so matching our, our long-term assets to either long-term capital expenditures or, or debt is, is responsible. To continue using fixed assets for reoccurring costs is not responsible. And I think that we have gotten by with it, but if we continue to do it, what happens when we are just down to this courthouse and we have to sell it to balance our budget? Are we gonna be able to pay rent to continue to meet and continue to vote on things? Or are we gonna be out front in the park? And so um, I will be giving you all the handouts. I welcome questions, happy to discuss it further. Um, and with that, I, I renew my motion and ask for your support. All right, thank you, council member. Uh, we have a motion to approve. Uh, any discussion? There are two amendments on this bill. All right, uh, seeing nobody in the queue. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Uh, you adopt on second reading. 
Uh, BL 2018-1334 by Council Members Henderson and Freeman. This is an ordinance amending Title V of the Metropolitan Code to impose the full privilege tax allowed under state law upon the sale of tickets to events at the new Major League Soccer Stadium to eliminate general fund subsidy for debt service and to better supplement or support future maintenance. Council Member Henderson. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, if I intend to defer indefinitely, do I need to request committee reports? Yeah, let's go ahead and get the committee, the committee reports. reports, please. Uh, so I'm going to uh, Council Member Vercher, Budget and Finance. Thank you, Vice Mayor. At the request of the sponsor, Budget and Finance recommended approval 1440 against for an indefinite deferral. All right, uh, Council Member Swope. Let's see who's handling his. Uh, Council Member Pridemore, hold on just a second. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Co uh, codes, fairgrounds, and farmers market at the request of the sponsor. Uh, Voted four, four, zero against for uh, indefinite deferral. All right, thank you, Council Member. And I've got Conventions Tourism, Council Member Hart. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. The Conventions Tourism and Public Entertainment Facilities Committee, also at the request of the sponsor, unanimously voted five in favor and uh, zero against for the deferral. Thank you, Council Member. Back to Council Member Henderson. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, with that, I'd like to move an indefinite deferral with just a brief explanation. Please. All right, so the council member has moved for an indefinite deferral. Do I have a second? Properly seconded. Council member Henderson. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I just wanted to express my appreciation to Councilman uh, Freeman for his co-sponsorship of this and remind colleagues uh, that I uh, brought this bill to bring attention um, to the importance of us uh, stewarding our, our major municipal assets like stadiums. Um, our taxpayers want these stadiums to pay for themselves, and they rarely do. Um, I am concerned that the uh, ticket tax, as uh, currently structured, um, is going to result in a shortfall in the early years on our debt service. Um, so that means uh, now that 15% of our operating budget is in debt service, uh, that potentially we'll have more coming out of the operating budget uh, to fund this stadium. Um, and I personally don't find that uh, acceptable. Um, so my intent in bringing this bill was just to open up this conversation um, for us to bring some intention and focus to this. Uh, the state allows 10%, uh, and I think it's important that we begin as we intend to go. Um, and that we know that we uh, are doing that really out of the box and then it's incumbent upon the ownership group uh, to set the ticket um, where they think is a good place to sell it and for it to be affordable for our community um, because we're all excited for soccer to be here. So uh, with that, um, I will uh, continue to inquire and get more information for colleagues, but um, please let's continue to be focused on um, this stadium and making sure that uh, we uh, uh, cover our, our debt service and fund our maintenance appropriately. With that, um, I renew my motion to defer indefinitely. Right, thank you, Council Member. If there's a motion to uh, defer indefinitely, it's been properly seconded. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes. We're on uh, BL 2018 1363 by councils, Council Members Wazo and Glover. Uh, this was approved with conditions to disapprove without all conditions by the Planning Commission 4-2. Uh, an ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, uh, which are the zoning ordinances, by changing from RS-10 to SP zoning on properties located at 940, 944 Curry Road and Curry Road unnumbered, approximately 530 feet northwest of Vincent Drive, 5.15 acres to permit 24 res multi-residential family uh, residential units. Council Member Wazo. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Committee reports, please. All right, Council Member Bedney, uh, planning. Yeah, uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. The committee reviewed the legislation and decided to defer for two meetings and to ask uh, the legislation to be re-referred to the committee. Okay, uh, Council Member Wazo. Defer for two meetings. Okay, uh, so the motion is to defer two meetings uh, with a re-referral back to planning Properly seconded, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no, you adopt. BL 2018 1376 by Council Member Syracuse, ordinance amending Chapter 7.16 of the Metropolitan Code pertaining to the location restrictions for the sale of liquor. Council Member Syracuse. 
Thank you, Vice Mayor. Committee reports, please. Council Member Freeman, Public Safety. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Public Safety, Beer and Regulated Beverages uh, looked at this measure and we voted to approve six in favor, zero against. Okay, Council Member Syracuse. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Move approval with a brief explanation. Okay, I have a motion to approve, properly seconded. Council Member Syracuse. Thank you, sir. Um, as you might notice in the analysis, this legislation really only impacts two properties in the entire county. Um, I do have one constituent that is a little sensitive to, uh, you know, mom and pop uh, liquor stores in, in, in the area, and uh, I'm, I'm asking for it to, this, to move this on the second with the uh, understanding that I may very well come back with an amendment on third that more clearly defines what this is doing um, and does not, uh, per it doesn't uh, present any real, real competition with mom and pop liquor stores. All right. Thank you, Council Member. Um, any discussion? So I have a motion uh, properly seconded to approve. This is uh, BL 2018-1376. Uh, Council Member Sledge. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I just procedural question. I, I am fully in support of the Council Member moving this tonight. To amend on third, I think we'll have to suspend the rules. Is that correct? Okay, I just want to be sure. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Council Member. Any other discussion? Seeing none, remember on second reading. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on second reading. Uh, BL 2018 1385 by Councilmember Henderson. This is an ordinance amending Chapter 1.04 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by adding a new section 1.04.070, establishing general compliance requirements for all permits issued by the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County. Councilmember Henderson. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. Committee reports, please. Councilmember uh, Pridemore, uh, I've got you with um, codes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, codes, Fairgrounds, and Farmers Market approved four four zero against. All right, uh, Council Member Lee. Rules. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Rules approved five to zero. All right, Council Member Henderson. Uh, with all committee reports in, I would move approval, please. All right, so a motion to approve. Is there, is no there an amendment on that? No, no amendment. Uh, it's been properly moved, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. Opposed, no, you adopt. Uh, BL 2018-1386 by Council Member O'Connell. This is an ordinance to provide for the designation of public property within specified areas of downtown Nashville as a temporary special event zone during the time period between beginning at 9 o'clock p.m. on December 30th, 2018 and ending at 6 o'clock a.m. on January 1st, 2019 relative to the use of these events in conjunction with the 2018 New Year's Eve celebration related activities and events. Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, request committee reports, please. Um, going to convention, Councilmember Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. The Convention's Tourism and Public Entertainment Facilities Committee voted unanimously five in favor and zero against. Thank you, Councilmember. Back to Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to move approval. So I have a motion to approve. It's been properly seconded. Councilmember, do you have an amendment on this? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we did. Uh, thank you for the reminder, Mr. Vice Mayor. And we did actually uh, process that in committee as well. I'd like to move the amendment, please. All right. Uh, before I get to the amendment, I believe that Council Member Hurt, on behalf of conventions, uh, you want to change that to 640 against? Council Member Hurt? Uh, 640 against. Okay, so now we're, uh, we're still on 2018-1386. This is a motion to uh, amend that measure. It's been properly seconded. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to move the bill as amended. Let's get, let's get a vote on the amendment. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, explanation of the amendment? Yeah, I can offer a brief one. This is okay. basically to make this... We have done a few of these spe special event zones, as colleagues might recall. Uh, this one added some recommended language, uh, just basically referencing the fact that this particular one takes place on state property and just kind of uh, making the appropriate legal safeguards for recognition of that. All right, thank you, Council Member. Any questions on the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment say aye. Opposed, aye. no. You adopt, you're back on your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to move the bill as amended. So uh, we've got a motion to uh, move the bill as amended. It's been properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, we're on second reading. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on second reading. Uh, BL 2018-1387 by Council Member Lee. 
This is an ordinance readopting the code of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, Tennessee, prepared by Municipal Code Corporation, including supplemental and replacement pages thereof, containing certain ordinances of a general and uh, permanent nature enacted on or before September 5th, 2018. Council Member Lee. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, may I have committee reports? You may, it's your committee. The committee approved five to zero. With the report in, I would like to move approval. So there's a motion to approve. It's been properly seconded. Do you want to explain all the changes in here? Um, I would like to. But uh, we probably don't have time, so that would be fine. Okay, well then. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, you adopt on second reading. BL 2018-1389, Council Members O'Connell and Bedney, an ordinance authorized the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County to abandon the existing easement, easement rights located at Omahundra Place. Uh, Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to request committee reports, please. All right, Council Member Bedney, uh, planning. Yes, the committee recommended approval, 940 against. All right, thank you, Council Member. Council Member O'Connell, back to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Public Works Committee recommended approval, nine in favor, zero against. Okay, and a uh, motion to approve? Yep, I'd like to Good. seek a motion to approve. All right, got a motion to approve, properly seconded. Any questions, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on second reading. Uh, BL 2018 1390 by Council Members O'Connell and Bedney. This is an ordinance authorizing the Metropolitan Government of Nashville Davidson County to abandon existing easement rights located between Division Street and an unnamed alley adjacent to Interstate 40, formerly known as an unnamed alley parallel to 8th Avenue South. Council Member O'Connell. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to request committee reports there. All right. Council Member Bedney, planning. Yeah, the committee recommended approval, 940 against. All right, back to you, Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, our committee recommended in favor, nine in favor, zero against. And uh, motion to approve. Indeed. Got a proper second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on second reading. BL 2018-1391 by Bedney and O'Connell. Um, an ordinance authorized the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County to abandon existing sanitary sewer main and to accept new sewer, sanitary sewer mains, sanitary sewer manholes and easements for property located at 100 and 104 Fern Avenue. Council, this is actually Council Member Bedney. I request committee report. All right, Council Member O'Connell. We're reversing uh, it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this It's actually been great and refreshing to see Councilman Bednay take leadership of, uh, in the lead sponsor role on this one. Um, really, really proud of him for this one. We, in recognition of that, we voted nine in favor, zero against. All right, that's great. Back to you, Council Member Bedney. Well, I'm, I'm very thankful for the recognition. And uh, the planning committee, which I represent, uh, recommend the approval nine four zero against. And I move to approve this legislation. All right. So I have a motion to approve, properly seconded. Any discussion over these uh, sanitary sewer mains? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on second reading. Uh, Bill 2018-1392 by Council Members Bedney, O'Connell, and Kendall. Uh, this is an ordinance to amend the Geographic Information System Street and Alley Center Line layer. For the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County by abandoning a portion of alley number 940 right of way. Council Member Bedney. Uh, committee reports, please. All right, I'm gonna to go to Council Member O'Connell for Public Works. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Public Works Committee recommended in favor, nine, uh, four, zero against. And again, this, this is some great leadership and really proud of Councilman Bedney on this one. Great, Council Member Hager, uh, Traffic and Parking. Uh, BL 2018-1392, traffic and parking voted in favor, 14-4-0 against. All right, thank you, Council Member. Council Member Bedney. <coughs> I'm a little bit hurt that Council Member Hager didn't make any comments about my leadership. But uh, my committee, com planning recommended approval, 940 against, and I move to approve. All right, so I have a motion to approve. Uh, I'm going to look at Council Member Hager for the second. I think that's close enough. Properly seconded. Any discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, you adopt on second reading. We are now on bills on third reading. Um, BL 2018-1309 by Council Member Murphy. 
Um, this is an ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, the only ordinance of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, by changing from IR to SP zoning on property located at 405 40th Avenue North, approximately 190 feet north of Charlotte Avenue, to permit a non-residential development. This was approved conditions, disapproved without by the Planning Commission. Uh, Council Member Murphy. With all committee reports in, I move for approval. So I have a motion to approve. It's been properly seconded. Oh, wait, wait. You got a planning committee report? Just kidding. Got excited there. Okay. Committee report, please. What about my leadership? I mean, you ignore me. It's the, overwhelming. The planning committee recommended approval 940 against. Okay, back to you, Council Member Murphy. And with that approval, I recommend um, and ask for a rec uh, approval across the board. All right, so you've got, uh, we're on BL 2018-1309. It's been properly moved and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. BL 2018-1342 by Council Member Sledge. Uh, this is an ordinance to amend the geographic information system street and alley centerline layer for the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County by abandoning portions of alley number 1805 right away. Council Member Sledge. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Committee Report. I think they're all in. Oh, they are. Uh, yeah. I'll move approval. So motion to approve, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, we're on third reading, BL 2018 1342. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. BL 2018 1345 by Council Member O'Connell. This was approved by the Planning Commission 7 to 0. It's an ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from IR to MUNA zoning on property located at 1328 Third Avenue North at the southeast corner of Taylor Street and Third Avenue North within the Phillips Jackson Street Redel Redevelopment District and Germantown Historic Preservation District. Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to request committee reports, please. All right, Councilmember Betty, you're on. The Planning Committee recommended approval 940 against. All right. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to move approval. All right. Uh, it's been properly moved, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. We are now on uh, BL 1347 by Council Member Scott Davis and Council Member Anthony Davis. Um, this was approved with conditions by the Planning Commission 8-0, an ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws um, by changing from RS5 to R6A zoning on property located at 114 Lucille Street, uh, approximately 380, 380 feet east of Dickerson Pike, 0.17 acres. Council Member Anthony Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Yes, I'll be handling these for our colleague tonight. Uh, I will do a planning committee report. All right, Councilman Bendy. I appreciate the recognition by Councilmember Davis. Uh, the committee recommended approval 940 against. All right, Councilmember Anthony Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I will move for approval. All right, uh, motion to approve. It's been properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. We're on BL 2018-1348. This is Council Member Roberts. Approved with conditions, disapproved without. All conditions by the Planning Commission. This is an ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from RA to SP zoning on property located at 6022 Robertson Road, approximately 100, 105 feet east of Vernon Avenue, 0.19 acres, to permit one single family residential unit and one detached accessory dwelling unit. Council Member Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Committee reports, please. Committee reports goes to Council Member Bedney. That's me. The committee recommended approval 940 against. Council Member Roberts. Close. That's great. I'd like to move for approval, please. All right. So I have a motion to approve. It's been properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. BL 2018-1349 by Council Member Van Rees. Uh, this is an ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from RS10 to SP zoning on properties located at 224, 236, 242, 252, 300, and 310 Ben Allen Road, and a portion of property located at 214 Ben Allen Road, approximately 290 feet east of Morningside Drive, 38.66 acres, to permit 68 single-family lots 
62 multifamily residential units and a maximum 20,000 square feet of non-residential use of uses. It was approved with conditions disapproved without by the Planning Commission. Council Member Van Rees. Committee report, please. Council Member Bedney, Planning. Thank you. Uh, the committee recommended approval, 940 against. All right. Council Member Van Rees. Um, yes, um, uh, remembering uh, Richard King on this third reading, I move approval of his dream on this trail-oriented development project. All right, thank you, Council Member. Uh, there's a proper motion. It's been properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. Okay, we're on substitute bill 2018-1350. This is by Council Member Syracuse. Approved by the Planning Commission 7 to 0. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from RS10 to RM40 SP zoning on properties located at 2303 Lebanon Pike, Lebanon Pike unnumbered, and 100 Blue Hills Drive north of the terminus of Blue Hills Drive within the downtown Donaldson urban design overlay, 3.5 acres. Council Member Syracuse. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Committee reports, please. All right, Council Member Bedney. Yes, the committee uh, uh, approved the amendment, uh, recommended approval for the amendment 1040 against, and then recommended approval of the legislation as amended 1040 against. All right, thank you, Council Member. Council Member Syracuse. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to move the amendment. All right, so uh, let's get the bill in front of it. It's a substitute bill, right? Well, this is uh, the amendment that I'm about to move is actually an amendment to the substitute. Okay, so uh, let's get a motion on the substitute. Well, it, it was it was already substituted. This is the substitute okay. bill that right. we did last. So time. we're on the substitute. All right. So now we have a motion on the amendment. Yes. Um, and uh, it's properly seconded. Do you want to describe the amendment? Yes. Thank okay. you. This literally changes one word. It clarifies the relationship really between Public Works and TDOT in that the signal it's not required to have TDOT's um, uh, approval, which is which is good. So I'd like to move the amendment. All right, you've heard the amendment. Uh, it's before you on a motion, properly seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? Saying none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Uh, the amendment is passed. Now you're back on your substitute as amended. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to move the bill as amended. Thank you. All right, so now we've got a uh, motion on the substitute as amended. This is on third reading. It's been properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. Uh, BL 2018-1351 by Council Member Mendez, uh, approved by the Planning Commission 7 to 0. This is an ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from R20 to IWD zoning on property located at 2775 Couchville Pike, approximately 625 fe feet west of the intersection of Bell Road and Couchville Pike. Council Member Mendez. Committee report, please. Uh, Council Member Bedney, planning. Yes, the committee recommended approval 10 4 0 against. All right, Council Member Mendez. Move approval. Uh, there's a motion to approve. It's been properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. You adopt. Bill passes on third reading. BL 2018 1352 by Council Member Scott Davis and Council Member <laughs> Anthony Davis. Approved by the Planning Commission 7 to 0. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from RS5 to R6 zoning on properties located at 1408 and 1430 Rosedale Avenue, approximately 130 feet north of Crockett Street, 0.3 acres. Council Member Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Committee report. Council Member Bedney, planning. Yes, the committee recommended approval 10 4 0 against. Council Member Davis. Thank you. On behalf of Councilmember Scott Davis, I'll move approval. Okay, so there's a motion to approve, properly seconded. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. Bill 2018-1353 by Councilmember Sledge. This was approved with conditions disapproved without by the Planning Commission. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from IWD to SP zoning on property located at 1700 Fourth Avenue South at the northeast corner of Moore Avenue and Ensley Boulevard, 12.03 acres, to permit 130 multifamily residential units. Council Member Sledge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Committee report, please. Council Member Bedney, planning. 
Yeah, the committee recommended approval, 10 for, zero against. Council Member Sledge. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'd like to move approval with a brief comment. All right, uh, got a motion to approve, properly seconded. Back to you, Council and, Member. And I'm gonna ask planning staff, just put one map on the board as I talk about this. Okay. Um, so this property um, is gonna be one of several that we do on third tonight that is gonna move industrial properties <laughs> in our downtown core um, to residential. And this one is particularly interesting because uh, it's on 12 acres, as you can see, but as the giant kind of triangle sort of, yeah, parallelogram that you're looking at right there, all that has been mini storage use. And if you're wondering what the green is next to it, that's Browns Creek. Browns Creek is our most polluted watershed in the entire county. It is on a 303D federal list, which means you are literally not supposed to touch the water in Browns Creek. It is so polluted. If that sounds familiar, it's because it's the creek that runs through the fairgrounds as well. We approved the funding to do the first part of the Browns Creek Greenway when we did the fairgrounds improvements. This is the next phase. Um, as a part of this SP that we're about to vote on, two thirds of this property will be restored to the riparian buffer around the creek. A greenway will go in at the expense of the private developer. And in fact, Metro owns the property that is just below this property on the image, just south of here. Uh, the developer will also put in the greenway along the creek in this portion as well. So we're getting essentially 1,400, 1,500 feet of greenway and restored uh, buffer for uh, the most polluted creek that we have in the county. Um, I think this is a big win, quite frankly, for the entire county, and it's an example of what can happen, quite frankly, when one thing, when one domino falls um, in an area where there starts to be some reinvestment, others go pretty quickly, and this is a way that we can see community benefits occur. Um, that are well beyond what the initial investment is. So with that, I would move approval. Second. All right, thank you, council member. Properly moved, properly seconded, any discussion? Again, we are on BL 2018-1353, seeing no one in the queue. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no, you adopt on third reading. Uh, BL 2018-1354, council member Hastings, approved by the Planning Commission 7-0. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from IR to MUZ, MUG zoning on property located at 341 Great Circle Road, approximately 240 feet northeast of Athens Way, 11.13 acres. Council Member Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. We'd like to uh, committee reports, please. Council Member Bedney, Planning and Zoning. I'm delighted to do it. Uh, the committee recommended approval, 10 for, 0 against. All right. Council Member Hastings. Yes, sir. Mr. Vice Mayor, we'd like to move for approval. Got a motion to approve. Properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. BL 2018-1355, as amended, this is Council Member Murphy, approved with conditions, disapproved without by the Planning Commission, ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from IR to SP zoning for property located at 4110 Charlotte Avenue, on the northeast corner of Charlotte Avenue and 42nd Avenue North to permit a mixed use development, 1.41 acres. Council Member Murphy. Committee reports, please. Council Member Bedney, Planning and Zoning. Yes, um, the committee recommended approval 10 for, 0 against. All right, Council Member Murphy. Move for approval. All right, so I have a bill 2018 1355 as amended. I uh, got a motion to approve. It's been properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. BL 2018-1356, as amended, Council Member Murphy as well. This is an ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from IR and CS to SP zoning for property located at 3800 Charlotte Avenue on the northwest corner of Charlotte Avenue and 38, 38th Avenue North to permit a mixed-use development, 4.38 acres. This was also approved with conditions disapproved without by the Planning Commission. Council Member Murphy. Committee reports, please. Council Member Bedney. The committee recommended approval, 10 for, 0 against. Council Member Murphy. I move for approval. Got a motion to approve. This bill has been amended. Uh, it's been properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. BL 2018 uh, BL 2018-1359 by Council Member Sledge. This was approved by the Planning Commission 640 uh, against and one abstention. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from IR to MULA zoning for properties located at 425 Chestnut Street 
and 1201 Brown Street at the corner of Chestnut Street and Martin Street, 2.04 acres. Council Member Sledge. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Committee report, please. Council Member Bedney. Uh, the committee recommended approval, 10 4 0 against. Councilmember Sledge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Black Mayor. I move approval with the brief explanation. All right, I've got a motion to approve, properly seconded. Councilmember Sledge. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. So, this property as well is going to move from industrial to mixed use. This is the May Hosiery Mill. For those of you who aren't familiar, May Hosiery Mill um, was in operations for nearly a century um, over on Chestnut Street, uh, owned by the May family. Uh, we are actually creating a historic marker for this facility right now. This building has a pretty incredible history. It was the source of exactly what you would think, uh, producing hosiery, producing socks, um, but those socks were worn on the moon. Um, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin wore those socks um, from the May hosiery mill when they landed on the moon. Um, before that, if that were not enough, um, the May family had helped basically um, folks flee from Nazi-occupied territories before and during World War II, and the hosiery mill um, during that time switched from socks to uh, ammunition, um, I guess is the best way to put it, and they were actually sending those uh, weapon, that weaponry back over to the places that they had come from in order to fight um, in the uh, Allied effort. So uh, a very significant facility that now will be moving um, toward uh, several different uses is going, undergoing a multi, multi-million dollar renovation, um, and I do have a letter that is being submitted in with the deed that talks to the preservation of that, so that will be submitted as well. Um, it's a very exciting example, quite frankly, of being able to preserve our history in a way that will prepare it to be here for us in the future. So with that, I move approval. Thank you, Council Member. Thanks for the uh, history. Uh, it has been properly moved, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. BL 2018-1360 by Council Member Van Rees. Uh, approved by the Planning Commission 7-0. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from RS 10 to RM 9A, zoning on property located at 206 Ben Allen Road, approximately 285 feet east of Morningside Drive, 0.78 acres. Council Member Van Rees. Committee report, please. Council Member Bedney. The committee recommended approval, 10 for 0 against. Back to you, Council Member Van Rees. Um, I don't have any slides or history on this, but I. Uh, ask for you to move approval so that we can build seven more homes for people. Please. All right, that's, that Thank sounds you. good to me. Um, I have a proper motion, proper <laughs> second, and any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. Council Member Sledge, this is BL 2018-1362, approved with conditions, disapproved without, by the Planning Commission 7-0. to zero. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from IR to SP zoning on properties located at 630, 634, 638, and 640 Hamilton Avenue at the northwest corner of Hamilton Avenue and Hagen Street, 1.92 acres to permit 37 multifamily residential units, which a maximum of four units are permitted as live work units. Council Member Sledge. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Committee report, please. Uh, Council Member Bedney, Planning and Zoning. The committee recommended approval, 10 for 0 against. Council Member Sledge. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I move approval with one more brief explanation. All right. Time. I got a proper motion, proper second. Council Member Sledge. Again, you'll note that this is moving from an industrial property um, that was in the district, and this will go into townhomes, which don't seem um, that special, except that the developer uh, is doing voluntary workforce uh, housing um, that will be deed restricted for at least 30 years on about a fourth of these properties. This is wholly voluntary from the developer um, who's been able to, uh, quite frankly, make the numbers work. Um, and those are one and two bedrooms um, that will be right in our urban core, right near a transit line and services. Um, they have committed to that and committed to, um, you know, even further to ensuring that they're going to go um, to residents who are nearby who are applying. And uh, I just can't thank enough the developer who um, did this just basically when I asked, can you take a look at it? Um, they t took the effort to go to uh, the Office of Housing, the Mayor's Office of Housing and Adrian Harris and work on a voluntary program that they then brought back. Um, it is the old Kerr Brothers site, so it is moving um, from basically paving equipment that helps uh, all of us out in the county um, to homes for folks, including that workforce housing. So with that, I would move approval. Thank you, Council Member. I've got a motion second. Council Member Johnson. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to uh, applaud uh, the council member Sledge's uh, effort and bringing all these three bills to the floor and all approved. I mean, you know, as a district council member, it makes sense to have uh, density where uh, appro you know, appropriate density is. However, sometimes it's not easy to agree on community to be embraced and also get uh, those amenity for the community. Uh, for that, I just wanna uh, mention what a great job uh, our fellow council member did. And his district is lucky to have him. And for that, I would like to fully support this bill. All right, thank you, council member. Uh, so I've got a motion second on the bill. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. Bill 2018-1364 by Council Member Kendall. This was approved by the Planning Commission 7-0. to zero. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from SPR to RM20A, zoning on properties located at 2805, 2807, 2809, and 2811 Delaware Avenue, 0.68 acres. Councilmember Kendall. Yes, uh, Vice Mayor, I believe this is to be deferred uh, one meeting by rule, but we can get a better report. All right, uh, Councilmember Bedney. Yes, the Councilman is correct. The committee wanted to hear from him and ask that we defer for one meeting and re-refer to the committee. All right, so so uh, that was 10 for zero. Yes. All right, so we're gonna defer by a rule uh, one meeting, okay. We are on substitute bill 2018-1365 by council member Pulley. Uh, this was approved by the Planning Commission 7-0. to zero. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from R10 to RS10 zoning for various properties located on General Hood Trail, Robin Road, and Winston Place, south of Woodmont Boulevard, 5.30 acres. Council member Pulley. Thank you, Mr. President. Committee reports, please. Council member Bedney, Planning and Zoning. Uh, the committee uh, recommended deferral of one meeting for this legislation and the following, 365 and 366, at the request of the uh, council member. All right, uh, council member Pulley. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to move to defer this bill one meeting. Okay, so there's a motion to defer one meeting properly seconded. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor of the deferral one meeting, please say aye. Opposed, no. You defer one meeting. BL 2018-1366. Also by Council Member Pooley, approved by the Planning Commission 7 to 0. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by applying a, a textual overlay to various properties on General Hood Trail, Winston Place, and Robin Road, south of Woodmont Boulevard, 7.46 acres. Council Member Pooley. Thank you, Mr. President. I mean, just heard the committee report previously. Uh, I would move to defer one meeting. So uh, the report from Council Member Bedney for planning was um, defer one meeting. Council Member Pooley is deferring. Moving to defer one meeting, it's been properly seconded. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Uh, that measure 1366 is deferred one meeting. Bill 2018-1367, Council Member Pridemore. Uh, this was approved with conditions disapproved without by the Planning Commission. An ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from RS 7.5 to SP zoning on properties located at Palmer Avenue, unnumbered, 1207 Pierce Road, and Pierce Road, unnumbered, at the northeast corner of Lawrence Avenue and Palmer Avenue, 3.36 acres to permit 28 multifamily residential units. Council Member Pridemore. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. A committee reports, please. Council Member Bedney, he has sat down on the job. Now he's standing up. It's good. Yeah, I apologize about that. I was getting tired. All right, that's uh, fine. We were, we were very happy to recommend approval of this legislation. We take Councilman Primary in deep appreciation, and it was recommended 10 4 0 against. All right, thank you, Councilmember Bedney. Councilmember Pridemore. With all the appreciation, I move for final approval. Thank all you. right, so I got a motion to approve on third reading. It's been properly seconded. Any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. Bill 2018-1368, Council Member Sledge. Uh, this was approved with conditions, disapproved without by the Planning Commission. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from IWD to SP zoning on properties located at 806 Olympic Street and 1019 8th Avenue South, approximately 150 feet west of 8th Avenue South, 0.61 acres to permit all uses of MULA, 
with an overall maximum building height of five stories and 60 feet, all of which is described in, herein. Council Member Sledge. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Committee report, please. Council Member Bedney, you're on. The committee recommended approval 10 4 0 against. Council Member Sledge. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'd like to defer this one meeting, please. All right, so I, uh, I have a motion to defer one meeting, properly seconded. Any discussion on the deferral? Seeing none, all those in favor of the deferral signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. You approve the deferral motion, one meeting. Got that. All right. BL 2018 1369 by Councilmember Scott Davis and Councilmember Anthony Davis. Approved by the Planning Commission 7 to 0. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from RS10 to RM20A, zoning on properties located at 433 and 435 East Trinity Lane at the northwest corner of Jones Avenue and East Trinity Lane, 0.61 acres. Council Member Anthony Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Committee report. Council Member Bedney. Yes, the committee recommended approval, 10 for zero against. Okay, Council Member Davis. I will move for approval. Got a motion to approve, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. BL 2018-1370 by Council Member Pulley. This was disapproved by the Planning Commission 7 to 0. Ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws by changing from R20 to SP zoning on property located at 1120 Glendale Lane at the northwest corner of Glendale Lane and Scenic Drive. This is 19.87 acres to permit 31 single family lots uh, or a community education use of up to 200 persons, a religious institution, an orphanage, or a daycare center uh, over 75. Uh, Council Member Pulley. There you go. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, committee reports, please. Council Member Bedney. The commended, uh, sorry, the committee uh, recommend <laughs> approval of the amendment, 10 for 0 against, and as amended, 941 against. 941 against. All right. Uh, Council Member Pulley, back to you. Thank you again. Uh, I would like to move the amendments with a brief uh, explanation. Okay, so I've got a motion to approve the amendment. Uh, it's been properly seconded. Back to you, Council Member Pulley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, when uh, uh, thinking of thinking through these amendments, one of the things I wanted to do uh, after we submitted the original SP was uh, to discuss with all the people who would be responsible for enforcement of these provisions uh, and ensure that the language was tight. So uh, I made uh, pass by planning and made sure, because planning is going to be looking at the site plan when it comes through the final site plan. We will make sure that they understand the intent of the amendments and I uh, want to make sure the language is fit for them to apply what we intend by all of these uh, amendments. Also wanted to talk with uh, the urban forester who has responsibility for enforcing the tree provisions that we have within this. And uh, also wanted to uh, make sure that Steve Mishu uh, and Bill Herbert and Emily Lamb, all of the Metro uh, Codes administrators, uh, had uh, a look at this language so that those who are responsible for enforcing it understood the intent of the amendments and that we would uh, we have the language tied enough to uh, ensure uh, complete enforcement. So those, uh, those discussions led to some uh, minor changes in the language to ensure that everything uh, is working and those are included in these amendments. There was uh, one uh, number that was off so we corrected that. Uh, and I think that was just a, a mistake in the original uh, in the original language, and we also strengthened the quality of uh, the stormwater provision and strengthened the quality of the tree uh, protection plan provision that we have in here. So uh, those are what's in the amendments that I'm putting before you right now. And All with right. that, I'd move approval of those amendments. All right, thank you, Council Member. So we have a motion to approve the amendment. It's been properly seconded, uh, Council Member. Elrod, okay. Any discussion on the amendment? You have an amendment before you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Opposed, no. You adopt the amendment. Uh, you're back on your bill as amended. Council Member Pulley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I would move uh, approval of the bills amended with a uh, brief explanation. All right, so I have a motion to approve the bill as amended. It's been properly seconded. Council Member Pulley. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'm not going to rehash everything I said during second reading. Everyone was here and they heard that. Uh, I am going to go over a couple of different things. So just reiterate the fact that I've been working on this bill for almost a year and a half and uh, began this uh, journey back in the summer of 2017 uh, and made attempts, numerous attempts to try to save this land uh, through uh, negotiations to achieve a park of some sort there. Uh, that, that failed, and I tried on a number of occasions to repurpose the buildings through uh, uh, use with uh, other uh, potential property suitors, and that failed. Uh, so uh, the journey began with uh, uh, an SP file that led to significant uh, neighborhood discussions uh, and significant neighborhood input, mostly by those who are directly affected by this. Um, and that led to significant concessions which were made in the form of the amendments that are on this bill now. Um, so uh, you've received a number of, and, and we went over all of those uh, at the last meeting, so I'm not gonna belabor that point. Uh, those were strengthened with the amendments that you have before you. I know you've received a lot of emails, uh, and these emails, uh, uh, are, I've responded to all of the emails except the ones that have come to me uh, this afternoon. And uh, when I respond to these emails, uh, they, they're, uh, the people really don't understand all of the information that went into this and all of the information and all of the amendments and all of the things that are part of this SP. So the majority of people I've spoken to and emailed with, once, with it, once they had the correct information, uh, they have a different position on this. And you might note that some have, who have uh, reached out to you and requested that this be deferred, they've reached back out to you now in support of this, uh, this bill. There's also a site plan that is before you now, and uh, this site plan came from meetings with uh, uh, with a constituent group of a uh, small group of people who are opposed to this. They're fine constituents. They're really good people. Uh, one of the things about this is when you deal with a piece of property like this, uh, it can get contentious, and uh, a lot of people are, are really passionate about what happens here, and I understand that. And uh, I completely understand the advocacy. The group has uh, formed uh, a neighborhood group called the Historic Glendale Browns Creek Neighbors. And uh, so they put before you a site plan from uh, the brother of one of the original members of this group who is uh, uh, some kind of an architect. I can't uh, speak to exactly what kind, but uh, I first heard of this back in August uh, of this year with a meeting with this group. And I heard about uh, uh, the constituent's brother and uh, I've not discouraged uh, going down this path. Uh, we had a meeting with this group on uh, October the 24th of this year uh, with Mike Jamis and several of us here where we uh, discussed some of the things that they wanted out of this to include. I'll, I'll let you finish. To include, uh, uh, to to include uh, some of the amendments that, uh, uh, some additions to amendments. And when I looked at the amendments, um, you know, uh, they have four on here. Uh, one deals with stormwater quality and quantity, one tree preservation, another preservation of the historic buildings, and another dealing with density. We're not far apart on stormwater or tree preservation, and, you know, uh, one of the requests is for landmark zoning, and that requires consent of the uh, property owner. Uh, so that's something that we can't mandate. And we're not really far apart on the density. As to the site plan, site plan hadn't been vetted by... Uh, planning yet, and it's coming at us just yesterday is the first time I laid eyes on it, and I immediately was drawn to some of the things that are problematic, because one of the things that the neighbors wanted so desperately out of this was a lack of connectivity to Glendale, and this site plan uh, really does away with that protection. So uh, what I would say to you is uh, uh, I would ask um, that uh, you support this provision. These are amendments that uh, uh, we have worked on for a year and a half and they contain uh, significant neighborhood in input, protections, significant protections for tree preservation, significant protections for stormwater provisions, and uh, several others to include a sidewalk that uh, uh, is not mandated by uh, uh, our sidewalk uh, provisions. Uh, so I would ask that you vote for this because a vote against this bill would be a vote against those protections because as uh, our esteemed planners will tell you, uh, these protections go away in favor of a subdivision, a cluster lot subdivision, which will increase density and will do away with the protections that we have here. So uh, 
I also need 27 votes, and through attrition, we've lost a number of council members, so I appreciate all of your support on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, council member. Council member Elrod. Okay. Uh, council member Henderson. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I, would, I had clicked my button to yield my time to Councilman Pulley. Um, I, I just wanted to commend Councilman Pulley. I know we had had a lot of uh, members of the community who had some concerns uh, and uh, noteworthy ones, and rightly so, about many of the mature trees on uh, on this lot. And uh, I think through his amendments, um, something that benefits us all, I think, in really refining um, that SP language around uh, mature tree retention. Um, so I appreciate uh, that he uh, uh, dug in on that and worked on that um, intentionally. Um, so this, this one is very uh, uh, challenging, but I feel like, um, you know, he, Councilman Pulley really stuck his neck out to kind of file this SP um, and, and get in front of this. Um, and the, the owners have um, been very patient over this year. And while I know uh, all uh, community members won't be happy about it, I think when you really do balance all the pros and cons, it, it is difficult, but I intend to support it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, this one, uh, because it was a disapproval bill, until I hear uh, Council Member Pooley at the last meeting, I struggle why he's uh, pushing this bill. However, after I heard uh, the reasoning from Councilman Pulley, it make perfect sense uh, because without this special uh, SP protection, uh, we will not have uh, more strong uh, tree protection. And without this SP, we will not have strong floodway and flood uh, plain protection. And yes, of course, uh, it would be nice to be able to preserve uh, historical structure. However, uh, like uh, Council Member Pooley stated, we cannot mandate a property owner or developer to uh, protect uh, this uh, historic historical structure. The reason uh, for the planning commissioners decided to disapprove is, uh, in interestingly, because they wanted to see the historic structure to be uh, preserved. And, uh, to me, it's kind of uh, outside of the box because typically planning commissioners were to uh, recommend us based on the, the plan is conformance with the general plan. So in that sense, uh, the reason for disapproval is rather outside of the box. So for that are uh, all reasons. Uh, I am in support of uh, Councilman Pulley's uh, this uh, SP. So I encourage everybody to uh, stand with Councilman Pulley on this instance. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think you know this is this is overall a a tough one to look at. And I think I say that from looking at the trajectory of just where we do, you know, thinking back to Nashville next and the, the idea of growth and preservation happening at the same time, right? Um, you know, it, it, I pay attention to what Historic Nashville does every year with the Nashville Nines and so often as this year, uh, so many of their uh, projects that they identify as at risk of uh, demolition and in worthy of consideration for preservation are in District 19. This one is not but it is a project that I have a, um, a personal familiarity with having grown up practicing basketball on the Monroe Harding campus, right? And if I, if I look at that campus today and I look at the various site plans here, it's hard not to want uh, some of the most magnificent structures to remain intact, even as the acreage around that area develops with a very appropriate infill. Uh, I think Councilman Pulley has spoken effectively, though, to the extraordinary difficulties that are frequently present uh, when we entertain adaptive reuse as a, as a concept. Uh, he has a lengthy story of effort to try to secure uses, tenants, um, you know, basically folks that could make uh, a successful adaptive reuse project there in ways that fit both the community and the geography, uh, and it, it has been extraordinarily difficult. I, you know, I, 
I, I am finding that I understand the position that the commission took uh, from you know moving outside as, as Council Lady Johnson identified their typical policy purview and I also understand the uh, position staff took and you know I'd rather be looking at a design that I think um, was closer to this alternative but that is not the option we get to vote on I'm not sure that even in a deferral that based on the, the story that Councilman Pulley told, that we could get to a scenario where keeping a structure uh, that had no use would, would be of greater value to his district or to the city. So I'm, I'm sort of a begrudging yes here, but uh, I, I think it shouldn't be lost on people how difficult uh, these adaptive reuse conversations so frequently are. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Sledge. Previous question. You're the last person in the queue. All right. All right. So um, uh, we are ready to vote. Uh, this is uh, Bill 2018-1370 by Councilmember Pulley. Remember, it's a disapproved bill by the Planning Commission. So we're on the board. It needs 27 votes to pass. Madam Clerk, uh, open the board. Councilman Bedney. Everybody voted. Madam Clerk, uh, close the machines and take the vote. 27 in favor, two abstentions. <laughs> Councilman Member Pulley, uh, your bill passes 27 votes. Bill 2018-1373, Council Members Murphy, Vercher, and Bedney. Uh, ordinance declaring surplus and approving the disposition of a parcel of real property known as 3800 Charlotte Avenue. Uh, Council Member Murphy. Um, I would like to, I need to, I need a, I would like to move for approval. All right, all committee reports are in. There's a motion to approve, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. Bill 2018-1374, Council Member Pulley. Uh, ordinance declaring surplus and approving the disposition of a parcel of real property known as 2025 Richard Jones Road. Council Member Pulley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. All committee reports in. I move approval. All right. Uh, motion to approve. Properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. Uh, Bill 2018-1375, this is Council Member Mendez. Uh, this is an ordinance amending section 2.206.010 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws regarding compliance by the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County. All committee reports are in. Council Member Mendez. Move approval. Motion to approve, probably seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. Bill 2018-1377 by Council Member O'Connell and Bedney. Uh, all committee reports are in on this one. An ordinance approving the right-of-way relocation agreement for Malloy Street with CBR 217 Second Avenue LLC and CBR Raglan Parking Lot LLC and conditionally abandoning a portion of Malloy Street located between Second Avenue South and Third Avenue South. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I'm Almost inclined to re-request the Planning, Zoning, and Historical Committee report. I will not, and will simply move approval. Uh, I, I, uh, Council Member Bedney is standing up, but uh, I don't have his microphone turned <laughs> in on. So I have a motion to approve, properly seconded. Council Member Allen. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Since Mr. O'Connell is welcoming conversation, I've always wondered, what is a lay-by lane? Uh, uh, well, so this is... In infrastructure terms, it is basically to have a, I guess I will address the chair as I explain this. Mr. President, uh, yes. for the benefit of my colleague to my left, it is a, a lay-by lane is where you create off-road, like not in the travel lane infrastructure that still allows typically for a sidewalk, but it would be effectively a drop-off and pick-up area. 
Council Member Allen, you're good. All right, Council Member O'Connell, anything else? I will renew my motion to approve. We are back on the motion to approve. Uh, it's been properly seconded. Any th further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. We've got six more bills. We're almost there. BL 2018 uh, 1378, Council Member Syracuse, Virtual Roten. All the committee reports are in on this one. An ordinance approving an amendment to an agreement between the Metropolitan Government and, uh, and Plaza 2750 LLC concerning the acquisition of real property for use as the site for a new public library in Donaldson and the acquisition and construction of related infrastructure improvements. Council Member Syracuse. Thank you, Vice Mayor. With all committee reports in, I move approval on a decade-long effort to start the revitalization of the heart of Donaldson with more positive change they've seen in over a generation. I move approval. Thank you, Council Member. It's been properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You adopt. Congratulations, Council Member Syracuse. BL 2018-1379, Council Member Syracuse, Sledge Gilmore. This has already been approved by the Parks, Library, and Arts Committee. Ordinance approving an agreement between the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, acting by and through the Department of Parks and Recreation and Memphis Basketball LLC to allow parks to participate in a youth basketball program. Council Member Syracuse. Thank you, Vice Mayor. All committee reports in. Move approval. All committee reports are in. Properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt. On third reading, BL 2018-1380, Council Members O'Connell, Bedney, uh, all committee reports are in on this one. An ordinance authorizing SWVP Nashville Hotel LLC to install, construct, and maintain aerial and underground encroachments in the right of way located at 1000 Broadway. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. I do recall with fondness the previous report of the Planning, Zoning, and Historical Committee, and I'd like to move approval. All right. Uh, there's a motion to approve, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. Um, BL 2018-1381, uh, also by Council Member O'Connell and Bedney. All committee reports are in on this one. Ordinance authorizing LC Germantown LLC to install, construct, and maintain underground encroachments in the right of way located at 1226 2nd Avenue North. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, exhorted by the Council Lady from District 18 to move approval, I will do so. So there's a motion to approve, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading, BL 2018-1382. Council Member O'Connell and Bedney, all committee reports are in. Ordinance authorizing Fountains Germantown Holdings LLC to install, construct, and maintain underground encroachments in the right-of-way located at 1401 Third Avenue North. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. We could not have done this without the approval of the Planning, Zoning, and Historical Committee. I will move approval. Oh, yeah, so you got a motion to approve. Uh, properly seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You adopt on third reading. And the last bill, to BL 2018-1383, Council Members O'Connell and Bedney. Again, all committee reports are in. An, an ordinance authorizing Pazuti Nashville Hotel Owner LLC to install, construct, and maintain aerial and underground encroachments in the right-of-way located at 401 Korean Veterans Boulevard. Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. President. I can think of no better way to enter the Thanksgiving holiday than an expression of my gratitude to Councilmember Bedney on this. Uh, I would like to move approval. Okay, so I have a motion to approve. It's been properly seconded. Uh, we're going to have to go on the board on this one uh, because we have an abstention. Um, any discussion on this before we vote? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, open the machine. We are on BL 2018-1383. We, we got everybody in. Madam Clerk, close the machine, take the vote. 27 in favor, one abstention. 27 votes yes. Uh, the motion passes on third reading. That is it. I hope everybody has a happy Thanksgiving. Do I have a motion to approve? I mean, to adjourn. Uh, got a motion to adjourn. It's been probably second. All in favor say aye. All opposed, no. You adopt. This meeting is adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.